Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse. I am Peter, that is Matt. This is episode 327 of the show. And you can tell I've not done this in a little bit because I said that in the wrong order. Welcome to the show, Matt. <laughs> hey, what's up? We're Comics from the Multiverse. We're talking about DC Comics. And uh, today, it's going to be a packed show. That was a very packed show. Uh, a little inside baseball. This is the very first thing I've recorded since returning home from vacation. Uh, so if there's any ring rust, as it were. Yeah, he's, he, he is rusty as uh, Soraya was. I'm, <laughs> I'm very rusty. Uh, so yeah, welcome to the show. It's the DC Comics podcast. We get together and talk about the comics we read this week. Now, we didn't have a regular episode last week. There was the Q&A episode that me and Matt yeah, did that went up uh, at the usual time. Hopefully you had some fun with that. Uh, but we have a mix here of this week's comics and some of last week's comics. Uh, there are two comics from this week that we chose to push to next week just to cut down the list a little bit. Mm. Um, and because we didn't want to forget them because they're two biggies. Uh, so the two Black Label books, which is Aquaman Andromeda and Rogues, uh, we're not going to talk about this week. We're going to get to them next week because uh, we didn't have time to fit them in. Uh, I didn't have time to fit it into my reading but I definitely want to look at them and talk about them. So we're going to do them next week when there's a little bit less uh, on the plate. Because we also have solicits this week. So thanks for that, DC. Uh, but so we got solicits for January to talk about. But the books we're going to be talking about this week on the show are as follows Batman One Bad Day Penguin issue 1, Nightwing issue 97, Superman Son of Kal El issue 16, The Flash 787, Flashpoint Beyond issue 6, Batman vs. Robin issue 2, Batman Superman World's Finest issue 8, Batgirls issue 11, Batman the Night issue 10, GCPD the Blue Wall issue 1. Deceased War of the Undead Gods issue 3, and Jurassic League issue 6. So, uh, and, and I'll be honest, we're going to speed run some of those. At least I know I am. Um, uh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so. we'll, we'll, uh, it's a long list. We've got solicits. It's going to be a hefty show. Uh, we'll get into everything, so hopefully you buckle in and enjoy the ride. But don't worry, because there's always time. What's there always time for, Matt? Ice cream, pudding, pie. No, it's the flipping comicsology top ten. <laughs> <sighs> oh, I love hearing the sound of that in your voice. It's so it fills me with joy. You know what? I'm not gonna lie. We haven't done this in a couple weeks because uh -huh. we didn't, we couldn't do it on on the special show. Yeah, and I forgot. Also, I'm I'm sleep deprived. I'm tired. He he hit me with a sniper shot there. So let let let's go. So it's just this week, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, they don't. Uh, you can only go back so far. So right. uh, I can't go back and check the previous week. But yeah, so as per usual, we'll look at uh, the Tuesday release books, which is DCs, which is our, our main event, and then we'll have a quick glance at the rest of the industry on the Wednesday. Uh, so what do you think the number one DC selling book is from this week as of now on Comicsology, Matt? Nightwing. It is Nightwing. Issue ninety seven is number one. Uh, number two is Batman Superman World's Finest, uh, which is cool. Nice to see the Wade mm -hmm. book doing well. Uh, number three is Flashpoint Beyond Issue 6. Jeff John's name still carrying some, some weight. It does. Yeah. It's good, cool to see. Uh, number four is Deceased War of the Undead Gods Issue 3. So Tom Taylor also carrying some weight. And Deceased in general, I'd say, is pretty yeah. popular. But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, number five is finally Batman One Bad Day, uh, the Penguin Issue by John Ridley. Yeah, so. Not bad for a hefty, right? Yeah, not bad book. at all. So. Um, yeah, a lot of seemingly well-performing books here in the top five. Uh, number six is DC vs. Vampires All at War, which is the side many that we, we kind of dropped. Um, as with number seven, which is Dark Crisis Young Justice, uh, which is also the side many to the, uh, the main Dark Crisis book. Yeah, I got behind on that one by one, so I have them. I need to get caught up, but not this week. Not this week, no, for sure. Uh, then number eight is Batman the Night issue 10, the final issue. Uh, you know, slightly longer than a six issue mini, so, you know, I think maybe it declines a little bit the longer it goes on, but, you know, not too shabby by any means. Uh, number nine is the Flash 787. So that's cool. Um, I think that usually does a little bit better, but I think it's not so much that this did worse this week. It's just that there's so many bat books and event books that are yeah. there that it just it naturally gets knocked down the ladder a little bit. And then number 10 is Black Adam issue five. Uh, the movie just came out, so I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah! Oh my god! And everything I forgot that's out. Yeah, I got well, the tr I got the trailer for it a couple of times uh, the last yeah. week, so I was reminded. Well, I know what I'm not doing this weekend, and that's <laughs> back at him. 
I have heard a couple things about it, but uh, nothing that I'm particularly caring about, to be honest. If if you would have guessed uh, what my friend Rob thought about it. Oh, I'm sure it was the best thing he's ever seen. Not the best thing he's ever seen, but he did say it was great. Uh, so, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I'll... For, for those not in the know, Rob loves everything. Yes. It's very rare when he doesn't like something, so... Yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, like, I didn't even really see the full trailer till the theater this past week, and honestly, it did not make me, you know, thrilled about the, the chance of going to see it. I mean, Pierce Brosnan and his fate makes me curious. However, again, I forgot it came out, and I was kind of looking forward to it. So, uh, it'll be on HBO Max soon, and I'll watch it from the comfort of my couch. Mm. If Max is still around. <laughs> I don't want to give uh, Zaslav any ideas. Yeah. Uh, looking just a little bit further up, uh, Rose came out number 12. What's weird is that I can't see Aquaman Andromeda on this at all, which is weird, because I che- I double-checked it came out, and it's available on Comixology, so... Yeah, I don't that's know. right, I got it, so... Yeah, it I there. Yeah, I don't know what's weird, because there's a lot of, like, anime books and, like, collections and stuff that came out that are after that point. I, very weird. Um, so I don't know if it's just maybe a slight glitch that it's just not been put into this chart, but... Uh, regardless, that's your DC books from, from Tuesday. So then if we look at Wednesday for the rest of the industry, which usually just means Marvel and maybe one or two indies, um, any guesses as to what the number one book on Wednesday is? Let me pull up the Marvel books that were out. There it is. Um, is. I'm going to guess X-Men 16. You're right. Look at you. You're doing well. You had a week off and you're, you're, you're feeling all well, rejuvenated. You know, Nightwing would have been my first guess anyways. And then is there a next book? That's probably the top one for Marvel right now. Yeah. Uh, number two is X Force issue thirty three. Mm-hmm. Number three is Avengers sixty one, and then number four is Thor issue twenty eight, uh, and then number five is Miracle Man, Miracle Man by Gaiman and uh, someone else. This is a Silver Age collection, but looks a bit. That sounds. Uh, I remember hearing about that in Wizard Magazine. Oh no, it's not a collection. Uh, it is an issue. It's a uh, it's so Merle, Merle Command by Gaiman and Buckingham, the Silver Age issue one of six. It's a mini series. So oh, shoot! So they're doing like an old school sort of style uh, wow. mini series. That's kind of that's interesting. Yeah, there's very similar to Captain Marvel. Um, over there, Shazam, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, over there, I can't remember what his original name was. Was it Marvel Man? And they had to switch it to Miracle Man. I can't remember, but oh, don't ask me. There's a whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number six is Moon Knight issue sixteen, and then number seven is Sonic the Hedgehog. Sc- uh, Scrap Nick Island issue one, so this is a, a Sonic mini. Mm-hmm. So very good issue one of four that is. Uh, number eight is Darth Vader. Number nine is Defenders Beyond, and then number ten is Midnight Suns issue two, which is a two of five. So very good. Uh, yeah. So. That's cool. Uh, but Alien and Predator back to back at numbers uh, thirteen and fourteen. Interestingly, uh, I have to say, so they've the renumbered Alien back to issue one. This is issue two that came out this week. Um, it's still Johnson writing, but they've changed the artist, which can only be a good thing uh, from mm-hmm. uh, the previous artist. So, cool. yeah, yeah. Uh, so there you go. That's Cowboys Lodge top ten. Uh, nothing too exciting to report this week, but uh, it's always nice to have it back. I'm sure everyone feels the comfort of a nice warm blanket. Mm-hmm. No, just me. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love a blanket. Of course you do. Well, who doesn't love a blanket? All right. Yep. Well, I was about to say let's talk about the comics and start getting through them, but unfortunately, we have the mammoth that is solicits to get to first. <laughs> so strap in for the giant solicits, and I have not had the chance to look at any of these. So this is going to be a nice little journey of discovery as we go. Uh, so. Kicking off with uh, Batman issue 131, which is out in the 3rd of January. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zarsky continuing his run. Uh, so, very neat. Um, eh, nothing too fancy to report here. Um, then we get to Lazarus Planet Alpha issue 1. We knew this was coming, of course. They, they, they announced this in advance. Uh, mm-hmm. was, was this uh, the episode that I did with Connor? Uh, with all the yes. Lazarus Planet stuff, yeah. Yep. Uh, what's weird is that, so you've got the, the Alpha and the Omega which is the bookend mm-hmm. issues, but all the issues in between have titles as well. They're not numbers, which is really annoying, just from a, you know, neatness yeah. and easy to follow sake. But hey, whatever. 
Uh, so Azure's Planet Alpha is written by Mark Wade and Jean Lun Yang. That's the particular team on this uh, book. Uh, and then art by Ricardo Federici, Billy Tan, and more. So, cool. Um, yeah. Ooh, so. there's a Poison Ivy cover that looks kind of like Cedric. Oh, very nice. It's not him, though. Yeah, Maybe so that's Matina. Yeah, so this is spinning out of issue four of Batman vs. Robin. Robin. Yep. Uh, so we'll 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 see. Uh, obviously, we got issue two of that to talk about today. So we'll 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 talk mm-hmm. more later. Uh, there you got Lazarus Planet Assault on Krypton. Um, this has got stories by Nicole Maines, C. S. Picat, Frank Burberry, and Leah Williams. So there's your writers. So mm-hmm. that would suggest that this forty-eight page book has maybe four stories in it. Um, yeah. I have to admit, I, I'm not sure how you feel about this uh, this event. I love that Mark Wade's like the one behind it and doing all that stuff. It does kind of feel like a a series of one shots with short stories in it rather than an actual story to read through. But yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, then we got Lazarus Planet. We once were gods issue one, which has got stories by Francis Manipal, Dan Waters, Philip Kennedy Johnson, and Josie Campbell in it. Uh, so, so out of uh, if we're gonna pick one, right? Let's say they're out on the same week. I don't think they are. One twenty four. And, yeah, they're not. This one's much more just based off the creators. This oh, is much more. Yeah, the writers on this, this uh, We yeah. Were Once Gods, does look and a lot got, more mouth-watering. Yeah, and, and the art, you got Manipole, Max Dunbar, Jack Herbert, and Caitlin Yarsky. So, uh, yeah. Oh, God, there's some sort of weird Joker, Martian Manhunter monster in one of the covers for this. <laughs> it's kind of Doomsday-esque, uh, actually, as well, now that I'm looking at it. yeah. Yeah, more Doomsday, I'd say, than Joker. But I, I get what you say, Joker, because mm. of the smile. Uh, also the green and the purple, but I guess yeah. that's also uh, Ma- Master Manhunter's colors as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we got Lazarus Planet Legends Reborn. Uh, this has got stories by Alex Segura, Greg Pak. Oh, it's nice to see him in DC Comic again. Yeah. Uh, Alex uh, Packnadel and Dennis Culver. Uh, and art with Clayton Henry, Chris Mitten, Mikhail Jung, and Jesus Marino. So, there's another one of those. Uh, so yeah, there's three of those plus the the alpha in January. So that's man, neat. this feels more like a reset. Just reading some of these solicits than uh, than Dark Crisis does. <laughs> this well, is it, weird. Yeah, but it's shaking. Th- yeah, but things are going to go back to some normalcy at the end of it, though. No, yeah, but it's the same stuff. Like we'll explore corners of the planet's newly awakened and primed to restore some heroes and villains long mm-hmm. forgotten. So I mean, like it seems like that we're going to get some new stuff coming out of this, even more so than. Oh, maybe. Yeah, you know. yeah, when it gets to the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the Lazarus Planet stuff. Then we got Monkey Prince, <laughs> issue 10, which is a Batman versus Robin tie-in, apparently, in January. Yeah, I'm going to have to get caught up on that book, because I was enjoying it, and it was just... Mm. got behind me. Then we got Batman and the Joker, the Deadly Duo, issue 3. This is the Mark Silvestri book. Issue 3 of 7. <laughs> not interested. <laughs> I mean, I'm not surprised, but uh, yeah. there you go. Uh, we got Nightwing issue 100, which is yep. a 56-page special issue, which is not surprising. Yep. They're doing a bigger, making a bigger deal out of it. Um, oh. So Tom Taylor is obviously the writer. Main art's by Brill Redondo, but there's also art by uh, Rick Lenardi, Scott McDaniel, Mikel Yanni, and Javier Fernandez. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Damn, Scott McDaniel's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah, the uh, Redondo cover, which is like, you know, Dick at the front, but with he's got all of these, uh, like all the characters that are related to him via the Bat mm-hmm. Family, the Titans, the Super Family that he's friends with. Basically, the DC Universe. Basically, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The big one hundred in the sky. It's a really nice issue uh, one hundred cover, but there's mm-hmm. a few of them to be fair here. Um, yeah. uh, but there's one where Babs has got him wrapped up in a uh, the, the the wire for the keyboard <laughs> or computer keyboard. Uh. Every single one of these covers are are great. Who's this? Th- who's the blue one? Oh, there's a two page one that's uh, that's oh, the Dan Moore cover that looks really really nice. Uh, a lot of really nice covers in here. Um, mm-hmm. there's even one that's uh Taylor that's and nice. Redondo. Uh, Redondo's drawing the cover. That's quite funny. Uh, so yeah, a lot of nice covers for Nightwing issue 100. Excited to uh mm-hmm. to to hit that that milestone. Um. Then we got Batman One Bad Day Bane issue one. This is a Joshua Williamson issue yep. with Howard Porter on art. So it's a very Flash team <laughs> uh, on this Batman. Issue. Yeah, I'm curious to see what that looks like just because we've seen, you know, 
when Porter did like the strength force stuff, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of mutated. Oh, hopefully, if if they're gonna do big like like jacked up Bane, I like when they kind of make him look monstrous. So sure. Porter might be the right person here. Um, with how these have been going, I'm even more curious about this one. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. See the second cover. That's that's not nearly monstrous enough. He just looks like Batista or Brock Lesnar. There, the big old arms. Hmm. Um, but yeah, oh, that one's scary. Who did that cover? There we go. Batman: The Adventure Continues, Season Three, Issue One. This is the uh, the Radio Adventures uh, yeah. comic. There we go. Detective Comics One Thousand Sixty Eight. Uh, still around view, of course. Still with these very stalized mm -hmm. covers that it's been having. So there's something in that happened that was said in uh, Flashpoint Beyond that I feel is going to be tying into this tech run. So um, uh, once we get there, we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. There we go. Batman Legends of Gotham issue one. This is a new thing. What's this? Yeah, uh, so this is, is this? written by Andy Diggle. Uh, art Boom. by Carl Moster. Uh, let's read the description of this one. Uh, with Batman preoccupied, his deepest, darkest, most dangerous secrets are about to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. The guest list is uh, strictly villains only, and the outlaw Red Hood fits the bill, putting him in a collision course with Batman's deniable Black Ops team, the Outsiders. With Lazarus Island spawning a wild card of superpowers across the globe, ooh, the stakes could not be higher. Jason Todd, Black Lightning, and Katana will have to put aside their differences to save Batman's legacy, and with it, the world. That's assuming they don't kill each other first. I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by a, a sort of Outsiders light story. Mm hmm. Or, um,. These characters protecting Batman's secrets could be interesting. But it's interesting to hear that there's some uh, knock-on effect from Lazarus Island, which, you know, it's all kicking off yeah. in uh, Batman v. Robin. Yeah. Um, I was going to say something, and then the flipping wind rattled my thing, and I lost my train of thought. So, <laughs> that's all. Alright, we'll move on. Um, yeah. DC's Harley Quinn Romances Issue 1. This is an 80-page, $10 uh, anthology Harley issue, uh, <laughs> including writing by Greg Lockhart. Sorry, Lockhart, not Lockhart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alexis uh, Quas Quasarano, Frank Allen, uh, Zipporah Smith. What? Well, that's a great name, Zipora. I'd be proud of Zipporah. that name. Amanda <laughs> Debert, Ivan Cohen, uh, and Raphael. Along with, oh, sorry, Raphael. Raphael uh, uh, There's a weird. Sp uh, line Space. split, yeah, on this list, and then Carolina uh, Munoz. Uh, so I don't recognize a lot of those names. So it feels like a lot of different types of writers coming out to do some Harley stories. Yeah. But the, but then you get to the art, and I only recognize two names too. So this just seems like kind of like a fun pitch book. Mm. Like, hey, do you have a do you have a Harley Quinn story y'all want to tell? And we'll put it in here. So, but yeah, to the the two artists that started out were Fico Osio and Adriana Mello. I mean, maybe so. they're testing, yeah, testing some new talent, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're just from a really different world that we just wouldn't recognize, and that's fine, mm -hmm. too. Uh, we got Action Comics 1051. Um, it's been billed as Action Comics Reborn in the solicit text. Uh, uh -huh. Begins a new format, uh, which we heard about, obviously, uh, you know, from the news. We talked about this last <laughs> time. Um, so following the events of Action Comics uh, 1050... Uh, we have so it's now a five dollar book with extra pages, but it has obviously mm -hmm. backups. So and just some are more interesting looking than others. Uh, but very curious. Uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson on the main story, and then we got Dan Jurgens doing kind of a, a sequel to Lois and Clark set in the past, and then Leah Williams is on. Uh, I think that's a Power Girl story right now. Yeah, three part Power Girl story, which spins out a Lazarus planet. Funnily enough, it mm -hmm. says here. So yeah. This issue marks the first appearance of new characters, new costumes, and a new era of action comics. So, you know, I'm excited for, for this. I'm just happy it's still Johnson's run. Some really nice covers, which we saw last time, but uh, they're still there to look at if you want to go check them out. Mm -hmm. uh, Batman Superman World's Finest, issue 11, is coming out. Uh, this is continuing the Boy Thunder stuff, which is Superman's sidekick, which obviously we'll talk about more later with this uh, mm -hmm. week's issue. So that's cool. Uh, Just Society of America issue 3 just to remind everyone this is coming uh, by Jeff Johns and Mikkel Yannon should be fun stuff that's a really nice cover with a clock 
So funnily enough, this is where the cover shop coming in. So Oh really? Yeah, flipping website I'm on. That is a as a crying shame. Crying, yep. crying shame. Um Stargirl The Lost Children issue three. This is the LGF Johns book. This is the miniseries. Uh Tun Knock mm-hmm. on the art. We can't wait of course see what these are like uh, when they when they start coming out. I think next month. Mm-hmm. Should be. Um DC Power, a celebration issue one. This is a ten dollar hundred and four hey. page book. Um uh, I would I I would guess from the the title this is going to be prominent on focusing on black characters and the cover would yep. back that up. But I'll read the, the text here just to give you the the the, the deets as as the kids say. The kids say that now? I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I I can't keep up with what the kids are saying. First there was a DC Pride and DC Festival of Heroes. Now it's time to celebrate Black History Month. Uh which okay, I mean well, when's this coming out, actually? I thought that was February. Oh, the 31st. So, yeah, ah, it's so the day before. So, it's the day before. That's, that's fair, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's time to celebrate Black History Month. Cyborg, John Stewart, Aqualad, Kid Flash, Batwing, Vixen, Amazing Man, and more take center stage to highlight the power of black excellence across the DC universe and the stories from a variety of comics, finest black artists and writers, which makes sense. Uh, the yeah. names we have here for uh, the creative teams, uh, we have Chuck Brown, uh, Morgan Hampton, Stephanie Williams, and Evan... Uh, Narcissi, uh, which uh, are on the writers' team. Uh, I don't think I recognise most of those. Um, Ste- Stephanie Williams sounds Chuck- a little. Yeah, and familiar. Chuck Brown does too. Chuck Brown, I feel, has done some backup somewhere. Okay, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then art we've got included uh, here: Valentine DeLandro, Clayton Henry, and others. So. Yeah, obviously there's a lot of names still to be added here. And it sounds yeah. similar to the other one shot where it's like, oh, maybe a lot of, you know, newer creators or or creators who have only done backups and things getting a chance to, like, flex their muscles a bit and yeah. see who writes it. Now, uh, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, this is the sort of thing where I- I'm more inclined to read this one because of its, uh, you know, because we did the Pride special, for example, yeah. when it came out. And we skip a lot of the big anthology books because it's hard to fit them in and they're usually kind of, you know, like they're not really that net needed. Mm. I tend to we tend to make more of an effort with these type of ones because they're you know there's a bit more of a nice intention behind it. Yeah, um, yeah. Festival of Heroes, we agreed. Like the intention was great. A lot of the stories were kind of just there. You know, I remember the DC Pride one though. A lot of the stories were really really good. You know, so it's it's a grab bag. Here, I mean, a lot of the characters that they mentioned are ones I'm a fan of, and like I'll read a Vixen story. Mm. It's been a while, so. Yeah. Uh, no, to be yeah. fair, they've um they've got they've got a lot of characters here who are all the only one that sticks out is being oh you're scraping the barrel a bit is Amazing Man because I'm like yeah <laughs> who's that but the rest I, of them it's like yeah for a game I'm not even sure who Amazing Man is so let me look not do I but yeah so uh you have Vixen you have Aqualad um I'm sure there'll be a Black Lightning was he mentioned there mm mm-hmm. yeah. So, oh, actually, no, he's not. He's not mentioned, no. but I'm assuming he's going to be there. He's on the cover. Yeah. Cyborg, John Stewart, you know, these are all, you know, Batwing, which I in wonder fact, if they're um, going to bring back the African Batwing. In fact, they don't uh, mention her in the uh, with text, but Joe yeah. Mullen, Green Lantern's there on the cover yeah. as well. So, Although I feel like if they were going to do a full-on Joe story, it would have been that team from, uh, from uh, her story. Uh, Jamal Campbell and I'm forgetting yeah. the writer's name off the top of my head. Me too. Man. Tired brain ain't, ain't it. Yeah. So uh, moving on we got Flash 791 Still Adams uh, writing. Uh, so the run, mm-hmm. the run continues. Very nice. Uh, pretty fun cover actually for this. It's just a white background with like him running uh, he's, he's sort of running like, in multiple like you know iterations and fade but he's like on the, the start line of a track with the you know what do you call the little thing they put their feet on when they're about to run a race oh uh, like the like the starting blocks yeah yeah he's, 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 got, he's got them it's a nice little cover uh and then we got the flash one minute war special issue one so he's getting an extra one shot to tie into his big arc that's coming um this is a uh, six dollars 48 pages it's jeremy adams writing it's got various artists so we'll see how it breaks down the cover though has Wally, Wally and Barry along with uh, Bart and Wallace, uh, sort of hey. in strips. So, a lot can happen. Sixty seconds as the Flash event, one minute war rages on. Writer Jeremy Adams gives you further insights into the alien speedster race. 
that has invaded Central City and how the Flash family fight back. So I suspect it'll probably focus on all the other Flash characters uh, and what they're doing yeah. during this war, which is cool. Uh, we got a Flash 1, 2, 3 facsimile edition, uh, so not much to add yeah. there. Uh, Danger Street issue 2, this is the next big Tom King 12 issue prestige book, so it's finally coming, issue 2 is solicited mm-hmm. now for January. Um, fun cover, I would say. Uh, really sort of paperback book looking covers, I would I would call it. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is fun. I mean, yeah, no, it's it's fun, so that makes sense. Yeah. Um, man, just reading the solicit and all the names that they're throwing out there, it's such a grab bag that I'm so curious to see how King sticks this landing. But I'm sure he will, because, you know, we're still, still riding high. Yeah, and then we got Waller versus Wildstorm issue two. I did not remember this from last. Well, um, Island Nation of Gamora is eager for American investment, so we're bringing uh, Amanda Waller to to Gamora. And that's not not a good combination. Nope, not at all. Uh, so this is issue, this is issue two of four. No, mm-hmm. so, cool. Then we got Wildcats issue three. This is Matthew Rosenberg writing this new Wildcats book, which is not a surprise given the grifter work. Um. We got the Sandman book five, so this is just a reprint of, uh, I don't know, a, a, yeah. a chunk of Sandman, basically. Uh, yeah, it says got... it collects Sandman Midnight Theater 1, the prose edition of Sandman Dream Hunters, and Sandman Endless Nights. So, yeah. Mm, interesting. Pretty, pretty big. And then we got uh, the Sandman Universe Dead Boy Detectives issue two, which obviously started the previous month in the solicits. Um, Swamp Thing Green Hell issue one second printing. This is interesting because this was a great first issue. Where's issue two? I was hoping it would be next, and that's why they're reprinting. No, I'm assuming they're reprinting this because issue two is on its way. It has to be soon. I would hope. It feels like it's been almost a year, right? It like, has been a long ass time. This was the Jeff yeah. Lemire and Doug Mankey book, and issue one was fantastic. We praised it to shit. I so there's I read a lot of comics. I remember that one distinctly. Mm-hmm. With old man Constantine and the the ships and the flooded world and yeah, so. Hmm. Um. So hopefully, issue two is on its way soon. But we got Batman the Imposter uh, collection coming out. That's very good, of course. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is in the leak volume two. You know, the second collection of that. The paperback of volume one is coming out. We got. Doom Patrol by Jared Way and Nick Darrington, the deluxe edition. So that's uh, collecting uh, probably all of their run. Yeah, deluxe edition collects all 12 issues of the 2016 run. Uh, and then Doom Patrol, Weight of the World, issues 1 to 7. So that's the, the two series that he did. And one deluxe hardcover. Now, I never, I read issue 1 of that and didn't really understand it. And part of that is because I never read a Doom Patrol before. So I'm wondering how it reads now that I have a better understanding of those characters. Mm-hmm. I do not know, but uh, worth maybe looking at. And then we got Absolute Dark Knight's Death Metal coming out. So Absolute Edition for the second death, second metal event. Um, yep. So obviously this will just be the main issues for the most part, I would assume. Yeah, it's the entire seven issue Dark Knight's Death Metal and features behind the scenes art from Greg Pulu. This is a weird one for me because I think I would probably recommend that an omnibus with all the tie-ins would be a better choice, which I'm sure they'll do if they've not done it already. Because I think the first yeah. metal just got an omnibus, so I suspect that'll happen at some point, and it's maybe the better option. But you know, if you like the absolute versions of things, then by all means, knock yourself out. Right, because these these are the bigger pages, right? The, these are yeah, because omnibuses are the same size as deluxe page wise. Right. Absolutes are like another couple of inches tall. Right. So you really get that art, which yeah. you know, which seeing seeing the concept stuff from. Capullo on those pages would be really cool. Yeah. Now you got Batman Superman World's Finest Volume 1, uh, Devil Neza, uh, you know, the hardcover of the first arc, simple enough. Teen Titans Robin, uh, which is uh, one of the young adult graphic novels by Cami mm-hmm. Garcia. Ooh, so that, that continues the Beast Boy and Raven one now. So maybe we'll get a Starfire. Hmm. I remember. Okay, you're not welcome. All right. <laughs> no. I thought you'd cover for me while I finished chewing this cake store. No, right. I'm not because I'm I'm reading the. Uh, <laughs> no. 
But he's just like, yeah, they bring up Raven, uh, Garfield, Logan, Maxine, Navarro, and Damian Wayne are on the run from Said Wilson, uh, from Hive, and from the horrible experiments Hive conducted on their expense. But where will they go? Who can they trust? Dick Grayson just wants to know what happened to his brother Damien. So yeah, so I like how Cammy Garcia plays into that Piccolo, you know, the Teen Titans series that he was drawing. Yeah. Like for fun. Seems like she's drawing inspiration from that. Yeah, apologies uh, for uh, eating during the show, but we started two and a half hours late and there's like yeah. there's, there's, there's treats in front of me, so it was hard to resist the urge. I'm starving. Ooh. So, uh, ne- next one, Girl Taking Over, a Lois Lane story. Yeah, by Sarah looks, Kuhn. No, no young adult graphic novel. Another young adult. Uh, I was going to have to guess that because I can't see the cover, but mm-hmm. based off of the title. Um, yeah. Uh, and then there's another young adult book after that. It's uh, Bruce okay. Wayne, Not Super. Yeah, that's right. He's not. <laughs> by uh, Stuart Gibbs, uh, with art by Barat Pekmezzi. We'll see. Uh, so Ooh, I, don't why, I, I don't know why there's a group of trades in the middle. It's really annoying that they do that now. Uh, but back yeah. to the single issues. We got Bad Girls issue 14. A special all silent issue. That's a very interesting thing. And it's uh, focusing on Cassandra Kane, which makes sense if it's an all silent issue. I mean, she does talk now because she's been around people long enough, but yeah, that's but an interesting... She's- uh, she's still more comfortable in silence right like, it's an interesting gimmick uh, I really like the cover it's her on top of a rooftop in the rain and she's holding what looks like Steph's cape in her hand so it seems like she's going to be uh, having to like, do something on her own uh, so yep. if I says that she, she might lose Steph forever so it's a good thing she, ha- doesn't, she has a single clue about where uh, Clue Master might have taken Steph and when Cass was still body swapped with her body swapped that's not happened yet <laughs> yeah uh, but no that's like a fun premise for an issue I'm excited for that uh, Batman Incorporated issue 4 by Ed Brisson and John Timms um, not much to really say about it but uh, mm-hmm. there you go uh, Batman Se- Ghost- seems like it well I was just saying it seems like it's become a Ghostmaker book because it says ghost- Ghostmakers on his own so uh, hard pass mm. well issue 1 was like this week so if you or last week yeah. I think it was did not read it. Yeah, if you didn't read it, that then you're not going to be reading the yeah. pressure for. Batman Gotham Knights Gilded City issue four. That's is, the game tie-in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, it'll be there for the game, uh, which is not getting good reviews itself. It has to be said. Oh no, which is a shame. Yeah, real shame. You know, I know. I said I forgot about Black Adam, but now I'm remembering a message Tim sent. I think yesterday about how excited <laughs> us DC fans should be for Gotham Knights and Black Adam. Yes, because they're out in the same day, and that they're, cheeky man. They're both getting very mediocre reviews. Um, Batman: The Audio Adventures issue five. Uh, oh, I think I said the the one earlier. I think was the animated series continuation, yeah. not not the audio one. This is the audio one, obviously. Gotcha. Uh, Black Adam issue seven. Uh, oh. coming out in January. Uh, Malik's got a new name. It looks like he's on my bolt. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, and then we got Blue Beetle Graduation Day issue three. So this is a mini series that's going to be starting soon. Yep. There we we go. got Starfire there, so I am a mark, and I will buy this one. God, you're you're the worst. I am. You're the worst. I'm the best at being the worst, though. Then we got Catwoman issue fifty one. We got DC Horror presents Sergeant Rock versus the Army of the Dead issue five. Uh, obviously, we we just tried issue one of that a couple of weeks ago. It was an interesting time. Uh, yep. Fables 159 is coming out from Bill Willingham. We got GCPD, The Blue Wall, Issue 4. We'll be talking about Issue 1 of that later today. Well, I will anyway. Uh, Matt didn't read yeah. it, but I, I read it, so uh, I have thoughts. And then we got Harley Quinn, Issue 26. Um, and she's wearing weird spiky goggles or something? Okay. Cool. Uh, Harley Quinn, The Animated Series, Legion of Bats, Issue 4. Nothing to add to that. Uh, I am Batman issue seventeen by John Ridley. Uh, Still going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's cool though. Louis Tunes issue two seventy and Mad Magazine issue thirty. I just, oh punchline in the Gotham game. Like, I, I really thought Mad Magazine was going to be the last uh, single <laughs> issue, but no. Uh, Batman Scooby Doo Mysteries issue four. The Human Target issue eleven. Why is that Sunder? You thought this stuff? What the hell? Yeah, there should have been up at the top. Yeah, but anyway, that's coming out in January. Obviously, we've been loving. That book and the cover is gorgeous. Uh, the, the white background, the sort of blue kind of like 
charcoaly kind of. Yeah, maybe why I look this one up. Google it. Of course, you why I look this one up. Why wouldn't you? Um, good stuff. Then we got Tim Drake, Robin issue five. Uh, I'm sure Connor will be forced to read it. Yep. Um. Oh, actually, maybe not because it's not uh Rosmo. <gasps> oh no! It's Ricardo Lopez Ortiz who's doing the art for this issue, so maybe that will change in time. There we got Titans United Blood Pact issue five. Wonder Woman 795, uh, which is still Clunan and Conrad. Um, so that's going on. And then we're back out of the trades and deluxes and things like that. Uh, Adam Strange Between Two Worlds Deluxe Edition. This is Richard uh, Brunning, Mark Wade, and Andy Diggle. Um, I'm not familiar with this uh, this story, but it's... Uh, yeah, not either. Yeah. Um, but it collects Adam Strange, 1990 issues 1 to 3, GLA issue 20 to 21 and then Adam Strange from 2004 issues 1 to 8 so that's cool it's, it's nice that they've found like a prominent Adam Strange story and given it a nice release though yeah every character deserves at least some deluxes on the shelf too yeah it's the only one that comes to mind I think it was also written by Diggle though was the Planet Heist that kind of set the stage for the Rand Thanagar War yeah uh, right before Infinite Crisis so because obviously um, we love Tom King's Adam Strange book but yeah it's uh, obviously very different, and it's this darker take on the character. Yeah. Uh, so it's nice to get some of this stuff. Uh, so you got Aquaman and the Flash Void Song being collected. We got Batgirls Volume Two paperback, uh, which is issues seven through twelve, which is just typical, not you know, collection numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Batman Detective Comics Volume One: The Neighborhood. Uh, this is the Tamaki uh, run and paperback. I assume there's yep. already been a hardcover of this. Yeah, this is, starts with Mr. Worth. Yeah, so this is so. yeah, 1034 to 39. And we got Batman the Dark Detective Volume 7. Uh, this is cool that they're continuing this. This is... um, So there's Dark Detective and... I want to say the other one's called The Cape Crusader, but each one is collecting Batman, and then this one's collecting Detective Comics from Post Crisis, just in like a long run. So this is Volume 7. So this <clears> is like... <throat> I mean... I don't want to put a, a, a date on it, but th- this is probably like three years after Crisis now at this point or something like that. Uh, oh but- yeah, this says it was from Tech, um, it collects Tech 634 to 638. And then 641, 643. Yeah. There's one issue of Batman in there because it's probably relevant to whatever the, yeah. the story is. Um, but these are really cool collections. It's really cool that they're uh, making those like eras of Batman very easily available. Um, yeah. So uh, it's really neat that they're still going with those. Uh, Batman the Detective. This is the Tom Taylor uh, yep. miniseries getting its paperback. Which one? In Europe. Yeah, probably one of the weakest things I've read from Tom Taylor, actually. But mm-hmm. hey, still has to have a collection. Uh, Birds of Prey, The End of the Beginning. This is uh, the next. Uh... Oh, no, this is uh, Sean McKeever. Where's this from? Is this like after so G- Gil Simone's run? Yeah, because it's got Lady Blackhawk there and it's. Collects birds to play 113 to 127. Did they already do all of Simone's run? Maybe. I don't know. That's funny. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm glad they're collecting. You know, keep going. Collect all of it. Yeah. But uh, Blue Beetle, Jaime Reyes, book two. So they've been collecting. This is issue 13 to 25 of uh, the Jaime Reyes stuff, which is cool. Uh, DC Universe by Dwayne McDuffie. That's cool. I like when they yeah. do stuff like this. So obviously, it's a, you know, it's just all these different like little mini There's or arcs or one shots that McDuffie mm-hmm. worked on. But that's cool. Uh, and then you got Joker Volume Three. This is the the last of the Tynan run. Uh, collected issues ten through fifteen. There we got Superman Action Comics Volume Three: War World Revolution. Uh, this is the the end of the War World saga. Uh, it has Action Comics one thousand forty three to forty six. The annual and the War World special issue one, or uh, War World Apocalypse was the actual title. So, yeah, so that's cool. That's, yeah, that meaty enough book. Yeah, it's like over 200 yeah. pages. Yeah. Uh, Swamp Thing Volume 3, Parliament of Gears. Obviously, that's the conclusion to the Ram V stuff. It's only a paperback, though. I, I, I hope his run gets a nice big deluxe at some point of the whole yeah. thing. I mean, that said, I might want to pick these up and trade in, in paperback and off cover. Um, just to have them. It feels deserving. I want to, yeah. I just want to read it again in a collected setting to see how it hits. Versus yeah. month to month. I think these big hardcover is very fitting for it. It, it deserves <clears> it for <throat> sure. Uh, Wonder Woman Volume 3, The Villainy of Our Fears, uh, is 
the arc that we just read that made us quit the book. <laughs> so, you know, take of that what you will, but that's uh, coming out. Uh, and then Wonder Woman, who is Wonder Woman, the deluxe edition? Uh, so this is the... Oh, I remember this. This is the first arc of the 2006 series. Uh, yeah. so this is issue one through six. Interesting. Uh, written by Alan Heinberg and Terry, uh, art by Terry Dodson. I think it's by Rachel Dodson. So, yeah, I've never read this uh, era of Wonder Woman. This is kind of a blank spot for me. Yeah, I... Was I reading? I think this is when she ends up joining, like... She starts in Wonder Woman and becomes Diana, Diana Prince and she's working for, like, the government agency. Uh, mm. It wasn't Argus yet, but it's very similar. So, um, yeah. Also, the long before Alan Heinberg wrote the 2017 Wonder Woman feature film, not the flex they think it is. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Uh, that's the solicits, everyone. You know what? Hallelujah. We were only 41 minutes into the show. The fact that we got, usually when we've done with solicits, we're at least an hour in. We've actually, mm-hmm. we've made time. <clears throat> that's good we've made time but that was shorter than normal that's good news because we've got a lot of books to talk about um and it'll probably take me a minute to remember what each one was because i've read so goddamn many in the last 24 hours <laughs> so uh we'll dive in um and matt remind me when we get to flashpoint beyond remind me that there's something we forgot to talk about in issue five that we have to talk about okay remind me gotcha uh someone pointed it out and i'm like shit how did we not talk about that so remind me all right, so Batman, One Bad Day, Penguin issue one, John Ridley, bleh, John Ridley writing with Giuseppe yeah. Camincoli <clears throat> on the R. So obviously these have all been very different to each other. Uh, Tamaki's mm-hmm. Two-Face issue practically felt in continuity. Uh, maybe it isn't by the end and I never got yeah. to reference it, but it felt like it was set after her run. Uh, yeah, whereas, it felt like it could have been the next Detective Comics run if they yeah. wanted it to be. And then... Yeah. King's Riddler story felt like, no, this is completely separate on its own little pocket of the world. Mm-hmm. And it's this very different version of Riddler. Uh, it's probably, I mean, it was the best one of the two. So far, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, here we have John Ridley writing Penguin. And this one, actually, unlike the other two, I would say feels more like it's Penguin's... Because I, I still say Batman's the main character in those other books, those other issues. Uh, yeah, because he's the character, and it's his experience with those characters. Yeah. This is a lot. I mean, maybe yeah. it's maybe it's fifty fifty. I mean, no pun intended with Two Face, because yeah, it kind of did show a lot of him trying to be good as well in that book. This year, though, this was Penguin as the protagonist. Penguin was the main character so, of this issue. Yeah, I haven't read any of the Parker books, but from what I can gather, this is basically the Penguin meets Parker. Um, it's very. It feels very grimy crime guy starting at the bottom and crawling his way to the top. Mm. Um, and I did not think we were going to get that story out of Penguin or as uh, to be as enjoyable as it was. Yeah, there's a lot of pages. So I don't necessarily want to go through it, you know, scene for yeah. scene. But um, you get this sad version of Penguin who we find out has been run out of the city some time ago by some new crime boss called Umbrella Man. And... Tight hands and shambles. Yeah, I know. And this this uh, penguin is like, it's him trying to get back into the city and it starts with him buying a gun off some thug and it, he only gives him one bullet. So he's only, that's all he's got. He's got a gun with one bullet and I thought, oh, that's going to come out of play. But then he actually ends up using it quite quickly and he ends up with a gun with three bullets off of his old, uh, like, lead henchman or whoever it is. Yep. Um, and it's like, okay, so now he's got a gun with three bullets. He's moving up in the world, and, you know, he, he keeps uh, sort of leveling up. Like, a- every single meeting he has with someone to try and gain power, because his plan is to, you know, take out Umbrella Man and retake Gotham City. Mm-hmm. Um, every time it's like, okay, this is a failure. But, you know, he actually picks up, like, this ally here, when the, the small woman who comes to help him. Yeah, I'm pulling up her name right now. Yeah. Because... Uh... I don't have the book open in front of me. And there's the the new guy who, who turns into his new henchman, like as well. Yes. Like, so he, he keeps like picking up something each time that suggests, even though this looks like a great failure, he is actually building more of a team the more he goes. Um, it's yeah, that's what I like is that he parlays the gun with one bullet to a gun with three bullets to a henchman to an old friend, and it's like he's assembling a crew, and it's he's doing it level by level. 
Um, and he's starting to gain, you know, his whole reputation back as Penguin. Uh, and, you know, the whole fact that the who the Umbrella Man ends up being and stuff, I thought it was also a fun reveal because, you know, uh, oh, go on. when we meet it? Penguin, oh, so I don't know if we were going to spoil it right away, but the reason he's called the Umbrella Man is because he was Penguin's guy that held the Umbrella. And he got tired of seeing Penguin basically manage everything and not ever get his hands dirty. And he decided to take Penguin out of the equation. Uh, but, you know, as I learned from watching a season and a half of Boardwalk Empire, you can't be half a gangster. Um, and and that ends up being Umbrella Man's undoing, is that Penguin is fully about this life. Well, I think the most interesting thing about me, to me about this issue is the idea that... Um... Like Penguin is a is a very organized criminal, and that mm-hmm. he keeps like a like he you know because we keep hearing this issue that the city is like much worse than it was when Penguin was yeah. in charge of the crime. The idea that Umbrella Man is turned it into a wild west where you, it doesn't yeah. matter what you make money any way you can as long as I get a cut. So crime's actually worse. There's more like sex trafficking. There's more dangerous things yeah. happening on the street. We see the few times we do see Batman, he's like constantly overrun and he can't get to everything quick enough. The police are overwhelmed. Yeah. Everything's even, much worse. Even Montoya is telling him, like, I don't know how you're going to handle all of this. Yeah, everything's uh, so much worse. So that, this this book is, in a lot of ways, is trying to tell us that Penguin's almost this necessary evil because he has a code. He has, there's, there's, yep. there's a hierarchy to him and as much as he has a criminal he does keep the criminals in some level of check so that things are... Yep. And, you know, when he eventually confronts Batman, he's like, you have to accept the fact that you weren't the one that kept Gotham the way it was. I was the one who kept Gotham at, at the level it was at. And without me, this is the chaos it turns to. There's like a sort of necessarily evil. So the big dramatic yeah. thing towards the end, which is Penguin's going off to take out Umbrella Man. He's like, you're going to go let me take out Umbrella Man because that's how this city's going back to normal. You, you want the order. Yeah. I can give you the order. So just look that way while I take care of business. Uh, and, and that was the most chilling part, right? Like is the fact that Penguin is so confident in lording this over Batman's head that it is. It, it, it's his main villain moment. Because I don't think of Penguin as like this big scary villain, but in that moment, he is. It's very, you know, not to bring everything back to wrestling, it is very Paul Heyman. You know? <laughs> I'm the one that kept all this in check. You're just saying that because he could play the Penguin if he wanted to. <laughs> well, there's that, but it's... <laughs> It's the fact that there's this unassuming person that's not a physical threat, but it's his brain that's the threat. Mm. You know, the fact that Penguin talks people into doing stuff for him. The the one lady who I couldn't find her name, I don't, because my iPad's going slow right now. Um, but the uh, the fact that she wanted nothing to do with him, and then he's able to kind of talk her into joining up uh, by by bringing up their past and and whatnot, and then how he talks the the one henchman into like no man you're a badass even though he misses the shot with the three bullets that they only have they're able to talk into those people into like oh no he did that on purpose because you know <clears throat> so just the fact that, that penguin does all this with words right like sure he has thugs that you know do things but he is a master of business it's, it's, it's a really funny moment actually that this new guy is nervous like he fires the three shots he doesn't hit anyone and like you know, uh, penguins like didn't even hit one, right? Yeah, as, as a, one. There's there's a moment in a, in a minute where one of the the the, the thugs they're talking to uh, says something like, I don't know, we were in danger for for our lives, and like, uh, I think her name is uh, Buster. Uh, the yeah, that's the name she doesn't want to be called, but then she ends up owning up to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, her actual name is Lolly, I think. But uh, there you go. She she. Like says, oh no, you have no idea how little chance there was of anyone <laughs> like getting shot, kind of thing. Like, yeah, it was, it was a really funny little beat. Um, that just it, there was a nice level of humor sort of sprinkled in here to, to keep it kind of kind of light at times. Um, you know, Penguin goes into his backstory at one point about how all the kids hated him and people only came to his birthday party because someone, put, you know, his mother paid them off, and that's why he kind of like started this this idea of like well no one's ever going to accept him for who he is so getting money and power is how he attains like the respect from people around him and he's determined to get that back 
Uh, so, it, you know, I think the, you know, he, he goes to, like, his money man who he eventually has to kill. That's where the big shooting thing happens that we were yeah. joking about. Um, Umbrella Man kills him for, for giving up some of his money to Penguin. Um, he end, they end up getting allies at this sort of, like, lady gang who have a lot of guns. They, they come and help which, him. Which, yeah, at first they turn him down because they're like, we're not getting involved in this. But because, oh my god, is that a muscle cramp? Sorry, guys. Hooey. <laughs> but Bob did not agree with me today. Ah. Okay. Well, there goes me talking about stuff. If we want to take a break real quick, Pete. Uh, uh, okay, all right. All right. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're in break territory. Oh, shit. All right, give me a minute. Yeah. Well, Matt has fixed himself uh, after that tirade. What were you looking up, Matt? So, yeah, we, I was talking about Lily, and I was trying to find her... It looks as of right now, this is her first appearance. Um, but it's it's someone that penguins a lot like because they're both physically different and people don't think a lot of them. And then that's how they kind of are able to pull moves. Yeah, she's not very happy with them though. And that's the other no. running theme of this book is yeah. that everyone that Penguin worked with in the past hates his guts because he was a mm-hmm. shithead to them. And maybe maybe if he's going to learn a lesson from this is that he should probably right. keep the people he's with, uh, you know, because none of them want him to get power again. They, most of them want are happy to see him down in the dumps because screw him. He was yeah, a- and that's 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 the funny thing too is that they're almost they're okay with the imbalance of power, right? That now even though that um, Umbrella Man took over, Penguin's not the one doing it anymore, and they're they seem to be okay. Oh, I remember what it was now. We we're talking about the girl gang, and that. Um, oh, there you go. Penguin goes to talk to them, and they're kind of like, "No, we're not getting involved in this." And because someone saw Penguin go talk to them, it puts a target on them. And Umbrella Man sends his people over. Yeah, most of them die. It's only the main most girl and maybe like yep. two of her, two of her people who survive. And they're like, okay, we're going to see what we're Penguin now because f this guy. Yeah, it, it becomes personal. Um, and so it's all like through these through this you know series of of events that that Penguin has orchestrated, and he's able to to turn the tides. And then even with that chilling talk with Batman is the final. Which I actually love how the build up to that is they're walking mm-hmm. down the street on the way to the iceberg lounge to make their mm-hmm. big confrontation, and Batman's just standing there waiting because like you know he's he's anticipating this because he's Batman and he knows what he's doing. Um, when Penguin's like, "No, I'm just going to talk to him," and explains why he has to let him do this, and sure mm-hmm. enough, Batman goes off to go and save other people because as we've seen throughout the issue, yeah. there's always someone to go save in Gotham right now. Uh, or at least some criminal to stop. Uh, it, it does paint a sort of darker world that they're in. And we get this big action sequences that are coming into the mm-hmm. Iceberg Lounge with, like, the Umbrella Man's goons are, like, waiting behind all the cars uh, with guns and things like that. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, uh, you know, Penguin is, gets beat up a, quite a bit, but he acts like an animal and lunges at him and bites out his throat. It's really, you know, it's, it's, it's nasty. It's pretty rad. Yeah, with, with without going black label territory and showing it, because you know, it kind of covers it with uh, the sound effect words yeah. and things like that. But yeah. uh, pr- pretty vicious, pretty vis- visceral looking. And the fact that you eat the silhouette, which we really don't see because they're pretty upfront with the violence until this one. Yeah. So it makes it seem even more horrific that they're covering it up. Absolutely. Uh, I think it cuts to some, you know, five months later and like. Yeah, you know, Batman shows up to talk to Penguin, who's, you know, got his expensive coat on, he's got his monocle, his hat, you know, he's back on top of the world. Um, but yeah, so... But yeah, uh, but it seems like this time he has kept everyone who helped him get his power back. They're they're all there mm-hmm. and they're all in good positions around him. Uh, yeah. So maybe he has learned some kind of lesson. This, this is kind of a, a like... For now. Yeah, like this was an enjoyable read, I would say. There was mm-hmm. times where I was like finding myself chuckling at what was happening. I kind of like this like certainty that Penguin, as much as he looks like a loser, he probably is going to succeed here, and you kind of have that feeling. Yeah. Like Everyone keeps doubting him and saying he only has a gun with three bullets in it, but I'm like, something tells me that's going to be enough. Or at the very least, it shows you how every time he trades what he's got for something better. You know, mm-hmm. from a gun with one bullet to three bullets, to a gun with three bullets to a henchman, you know, for, to, from a henchman to like two hench a people, crew. yeah. You know, yeah. It, it keeps it keeps going up and up. Uh, yeah. It's, it's so it's kind of like a like a very truncated like Penguin Breaking Bad style story. Yeah, no, it, it, it's very Breaking Bad. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Because you know, it's 
he started, you know, from the bottom after being deposed, and he climbs his way back and shows why he's, you know, the gentleman of crime. Um, yeah, what did it's you... Elliot. Elliot's the henchman that does it because that's supposed to be the code. Yeah, and then even though this kid throws up after he, you know, fires a gun at people, doesn't kill anybody. You know, by the end of the book, he's his muscle now. You know, and it's it's just you know a lot of good character stuff in here. What did you think of uh, Cam and Killy's art? It's it's good. It feels like um, there, there's another artist that it feels like, and I can't think of it right now. But it, it's just very basic, and it fit this book real well. So it's, a, it's a little house style, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, house style, I guess. But it's there's a dinginess to the part at the front, and then a cleanliness to the part at the back. It's like it gets more defined, almost like almost like Penguin does, until that point where he becomes an animal, and the p- pages reflect that. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's pretty decent. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing like uh, I mean. Garrett's art in that regular book really stands out. Oh, of course, um, yeah. Right? No, so, I, I mean, I, like it's kind of a tough art to talk about because I think it's just okay. It's, you know, it's, there's nothing really wrong with it too much, uh, other than maybe the odd little face that's kind of like a, a little bit too squished in. But at the same time, there's nothing that kind of wows me about it either. Or, you know, yeah. like there's, there's nothing that really sticks out to me. It's like, oh, this is a great piece of art. It just, it looks fine. And, uh, you know, I overall... I kind of like what this issue is doing. Um, I do think it's the weakest of the three One Bad Day books we've had so far. Mm-hmm. But not that's not to say it's bad or not worth reading. No. Uh, it's just not as... Uh, I, I'd say... I mean, the, the Riddler one still comes out on top. That feels really special. The Two-Faced one, I'd say, is a bit better than this because it, it kind of played some fun with Harvey's character. This was just mm-hmm. kind of a nice criminal story, I guess. Yeah, the, the Two-Faced one did have kind of a surprise in it, whereas this one is straightforward as it gets yeah uh, so yeah this yeah. doesn't feel like a caper or anything it just feels like and, and that, that's the, on a mission and that's not to say that it's not good at what it's doing which is no. it's showing that penguin's good at what he does right and why yeah. penguin had power why why cobblepot did get into the position he was in in the first place mm-hmm. uh but at the same time you know this idea like i i kind of like the point that part of the reason why gotham was at a reasonable level for crime is because penguin's actually the one on the, the other side yeah. of the, the the equation who's keeping it that way i do think the book maybe oversells it a little bit this idea yeah. that if he wasn't around it would turn into like no man's land almost and batman would be struggling right. that's maybe making him feel a bit too important but i do like the sentiment overall that it's going for right you know? well and this one kind of loses the thread too of what a one bad day is because you feel like this takes place over the course of yeah a week yeah or, or so and so like what what was the one bad day is it is it for batman is it him having to admit that Penguin keeps the city in line. I, I would probably guess that's what the real one bad day is. It's yeah. Batman agree, you know, admitting that he needs Penguin to keep the order on the other side of the yeah. the, the, the fence. Uh, but you could also say it's just a long bad day because of the way Gotham is for Batman, or you could, it's, a, it's a long bad day for Penguin because he lost everything and this is him coming back. Yeah. Uh, but certainly Batman having to admit that he needs Penguin to be in power, to, at least to some extent, is mm-hmm. you know i'd say that's probably the most poignant thing to say that the one bad day is but yeah so yeah i, I think it's an enjoyable issue uh you know it was an easy enough read as well certainly so uh yeah. what are you giving one bad day penguin i mean this is 7.5 uh yeah that sounds about fair to me 7.5 sounds good yeah um you know pretty good but not great yeah yeah pretty good all right Nightwing, issue 97, Tom Taylor, writing with Bruno Redondo and Geraldo Borges on the art. So, this issue is all about the protection of Moroni, who is uh-huh. doesn't want to talk to the police, but when he finds out that Blockbuster had all these secrets on him, and that the criminal underworld is going to find out about all of his nasty secrets anyway, he probably might as well talk to the police. And yep. because of that, all the criminal underworld are after him to, to take him out. Um, so there's a lot of good world building stuff here early on yep. with uh, referencing the fact that that previous guy got shot in the p- the police station because there's a lot of corrupt cops and things yep. like that. So who does the mayor bring in? Rene Montoya. We get the, hey. commish- the commish from Gotham who's agreeing to sort of transport Moroni because there's a lot of heroes in Gotham who'll help keep him safe until he testifies. So uh, we get uh, basically Dick and Babs and Co 
making sure that he's going to be safe while he's been transported. Uh, there were some cool little things here that I really liked about the, the world building, is that it's like, oh, uh, you know, Gotham to Bloodhaven's only like a 30 minute drive. I'm like, okay, that's interesting to know. And then also it's a lot of like open like countryside roads. It's not yep. like the highway or anything like that with a lot of, yeah. So I was like, okay, you're building yeah. some mood here as to what the drive is like. I kind of like that. Yeah. It's kind of like if, if Gotham City's New York City, then Bloodhaven's somewhere in New Jersey, like down yeah. the way a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I like that because and it makes sense because it's kind of, uh, Bloodhaven's kind of like the boardwalks and uh, like Atlantic City kind of vibe so far uh, in this run. Yeah, I, so, I would say that the the New Jersey comparison for Bloodhaven's always kind of felt what they were going for. Spot on. But, but yeah. what, it, what it is compared to Gotham. Uh, but uh, Babs makes a really silly joke here because basically she said, hey, we did a lot of things. We, you know, we've helped protect the city. Uh, and Nightwing's like, yeah, but, uh, you know, Heartless is still out there. If I kill Blockbuster, yeah. and it's kind of a shame that, you know, instead of justice, like, this is just going to create a gap for other people to come in. And uh, Bab says, and there's a guy who stole my heart right here, like a dark. Uh, I don't know, I popped for it. I thought it was Her funny. face, the expressions, I, that's a Redondo page. Perfect. Yeah. Because there is an awkwardness, and she is very disappointed in herself but, for it. Of course. But it's... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, but of course this is a big action set piece issue because we get uh you know this big truck that comes in to try and break up the police escort and we get uh the cops try to protect Maroney who's got like a bulletproof vest on and he's handcuffed and it's all very very chaotic and of course that's when Nightwing and Bab show up to uh, help things out and yeah it's really fun stuff with uh throwing the batons and all the rest of it. Uh, they grab Maroney uh, and put him on the back of the bike with Nightwing and they go flying off the bridge. Because yeah. even one of Monto- uh, Montoya's Gotham cops tries to cash in. Yeah, that's that's when Dick and Bab show up, is that, yeah, the corrupt yeah. cops are about to shoot him in the face. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, r- really just thrilling stuff. There's a lot of momentum once we get onto this road stuff uh, where they're driving. Um, and then they go into the woods and they end up, uh, after a little bit of fighting with some some of the goons, uh, at one of Batman's hideouts, he's got a few in this forest that's between Bloodhaven and Gotham. Mm-hmm. Uh, very convenient for our characters here, but it makes sense. And then, basically, they, they tranquilize Maroney, and Babs is like, hey, we, I've been saying we should have a wee getaway together, so they end up uh, taking their clothes off. And yep. it's, a very, it's a very sweet page, all the costumes like falling to the ground. Um, and I kind of love the dig for Maroney in the next page about, you know, I'm stuck here, listening to superhero romance the, the, you know like uh because they're, they're upstairs and apparently he heard a lot of things <laughs> tranquilizers only last three hours and this place has thin ceilings which <laughs> which is really funny because that implies yeah. that they were having sex for quite some time more, th- more than three hours <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and he goes i've never thought about superheroes in relationships and then just babs really you must not spend too much time on the internet so Little it's meta. a snappy dialogue that, that yeah. Taylor really nails. A little meta joke there yeah. uh, about uh, dweebs on the internet talking about superheroes hooking up. Uh, and then there's a taxi cab outside with like, that's weird. How did that get there? Um, so I, I, you know, I really enjoyed this issue. A lot of fun action with the big set pieces of protecting Maroney. Uh, good momentum. The art is very pretty. And even, even just the general stuff at the start about, you know, talking about the police corruption and how Blockbuster dying like this is actually, you know, a bad thing in the sense that it's going to create this vacuum for more people. In fact, yeah. the arc is called the vacuum. Uh, power, yeah. yeah, power vacuum. So then we get this wacky ending that I don't know what to make of yet. So this is the sort of thing where, you know, we'll, we'll trust in Taylor. We'll see what he does with yep. the next issue. Uh, but out of the the taxi cab pops ahead and the final page is, my name is Rick Grayson. I need you to get in the cab. What? <laughs> How? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, this forest better be mystical or something. Oh, sure. Like, and this is how Dick's going to come to to terms with the fact that uh, of his time as Rick Grayson, which, you know, thankfully none of us read. Um, but yeah, no, uh, when they wake up and they see the, the taxi outside... I got so confused because they're like deep in the forest on motorcycles. Like, how does a cab show up there without them knowing? And this is something, it's not just Dick seeing this, Bob sees this too. Yeah. So, this, this is not in his head. This is not some no. weird psychological thing. 
Um, I wonder if this turns out to be a villain who can create hallucinations or can create, you know, fake yeah. things or constructs or whatever you want to call it. Maybe, maybe magic something. Yeah, yeah, some magic. It says perhaps. this night might get even weirder. Yeah, uh, for the next one. So, yeah, who who knows? It's comics. Anything, you know. But yeah, I trust in Taylor. If this was a lesser writer, I would be worried. And also, this might be the best Rick Grayson's ever looked because of Redondo there. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, I'm not mad at this because this is going to be about Dick confronting right. Rick Grayson. So right. there's no way this doesn't end with Dick clearly coming out like the better one. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we'll we'll see what he does with that. But uh, there you go. That's uh, yeah. Nightwing issue 97. Uh, what are you giving it, Matt? So because of the, the shift in the art in the middle there, can't give as high as I would, you know, normally. Sure. So I'm going to give us an eight. Yeah, I think I'll give it an eight as well. Uh, I I I think that I think Borges' art is still pretty good. Like it's not yeah. it's not bad art by any means, and it no. doesn't it doesn't feel like such a jarring shift. Like you know, yeah. But you can you can tell the difference. You know, yeah, you can you tell. Can tell. Not on no pages anymore. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. So yeah, and I wonder if that's just because uh, issue one hundred's coming up. Maybe yeah. need some help. Uh, to- right stay on target and stuff a little a little relief yeah so you know that's what it is uh so yeah yeah 10 for me as well superman son of kal-el issue 16 tom taylor was seeing termy on the art so this is the other taylor bit from last week and um this is uh so actually this is one of the strongest issues taylor's done of superman son of kal-el yeah. uh i quite like this for two reasons. One, you've got the general kind of superhero or Superman style thing of him like going about his day and this is like, okay, this is all the different things he does during the day. He helps his mum at breakfast. He goes out. He goes to some children's hospitals. He, he deals with various crises around the world and then he's home again. Uh, but honestly, the moment, because the issue starts with him talking about how when he was younger, especially when he's superhero and first kicked in specifically, how his father's heartbeat was this sound that he focused on to control that. And he's not heard his father's heartbeat in some time. And now, now we know this is technically Return of Kal-El Part 2, so we're kind of yeah. expecting it to happen. I think the moment in this issue where he clearly hears it for the first time in months and just flies off into the sky mm-hmm. like a rocket, um, I think is quite touching. I think it's one of the most heartwarming things Taylor's written in this book. Uh, mm-hmm. so I really liked it. Uh, you yeah, know, there's all things like I like him going to the because the, the guy that he br- he broke his arm by accident when he was saving him to apologize, and the guy's yeah. obviously happy. It's like you saved my life, like I, I you know, the arm's healing, it's fine, right? Uh, but thank you for coming to me, still. Yeah, um, there's a small moment with, with Lois where Lois is, is typing and her coffee keeps getting cold because Clark just used to reheat it with his heat vision, and you know, so she tells it to John. So then throughout, you know, the pages of them. He's constantly reheating his coffee and it's, or her coffee. And it's this thing where it's, he's not that he's trying to be his dad, but it's almost just like he, he's just such a natural. He's falling into the same kind of stuff Clark would have done. Yeah. You know, it's actually just a little like, bit different. He goes to confront Lex about stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's actually during that scene that he hears the heartbeat and he, he goes yeah. flying off, which is a really nice moment. Uh, he's, he's seen him because uh, so, some police evidence got stolen. Uh, or something like that and Lex mm-hmm. is like he's claiming he has nothing to, doesn't know anything about it but he asks Mercy yeah. right after like oh what was taken and he's like oh that doesn't sound very good yeah. uh, so it's one of the red sin yeah something to do with red yeah. sin um, but yeah there's, there's some good little character beats here where Lex is like oh your father would like wait outside the window and watch from a distance and he he respected personal space, and John's like, I'm not my father. <laughs> so yeah. I don't no, care. You have far less respect for personal space. Yeah. The thing I love, too, is like, all right, so Lex has three plates sitting on this bench best, so, like, he's a, a really strong guy. John comes and puts his hand on the bar, mm-hmm. and then when you see him holding it, it's bent. So that's how much force Lex was... There's, he was still trying with a Kryptonian, pushing the weight or holding the weight on him, which I find so funny. And that's just something small in the art here mm. um, that just really, really hits at who Lex Luthor is. Uh, but then um, you can tell that he's not lying, which which I do like. Um, but it's well, no... It's- well, no, it's not like you can tell he's not lying. He says either he's telling the truth 
or he's or just lying. so comfortable with lying right. that it's not right. you know showing any of the usual signs of the heartbeat or anything like that. That's right. Which with um, Lex could be possible. Yeah. Well, it's also not the heartbeat where he's with Lex. It's an explosion at Rikers. Yeah, Rikers. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, I, th- I think I said he flew off because of the heartbeat. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, you know, he fl- flies it's off to Rikers, Rikers um, and basically some explosion was trying to break out Metallo. Yeah, uh, it's actually the uh, the hum- ultra humanite that ends up coming out and fighting John yeah. for a little bit. Uh, what it deals with is a fun enough little sequence, and obviously we know Metallo stuff cooking because of uh, Action Comics last yeah. issue. Uh, so you know, we assume this was Lex trying to break him out, uh, mm-hmm. but you know, but we'll, more than that later. But this is where he hears the heartbeat, uh, and I love as he's flying up, and it's these. It's this great page where it's four vertical panels, so you really feel the height of each sort of like yeah. you know part of the image, and you just hear this little thump, 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 thump. It's just a little sound effect that's uh, written in, um, and he's just flying up as high as he can, as fast as he can, and then you the next page you get the, the flying into Superman's arms. Uh, it's all very pretty, some of the best art in the issue for sure, uh, and then there's a mm-hmm. full page spread of them hugging in the sky. Uh, it's, it's all very sweet. I, I, I think this issue was a nice balance of like him missing his father and the, the relief of seeing him again, but also with hit, the burden of like being Superman, I thought yeah. it was really good. Because sometimes the actual like details of like the the plot with Gamora and right. Jay's mother, like sometimes the plot wasn't the best thing in the world, and that would kind of you know pulled it, it down. They're gonna override bit. the character moments. Yeah, and so here when when he hears his dad's heartbeat, <clears throat> it's it's in a moment where ultra humanite is calling him a freak and an alien and. Kind of putting these doubts into him. Um, and so it's one of those moments where he needs his dad, and then he hears the heartbeat. And it's just there at the at the right time. Yeah. It's, when it's, he needs him the most. That's positive um, force that he needs, uh, like, yeah, like just comes in at the right time. No, that's really good. There's actually another sweet moment early on when he's talking about his day. Uh, he mm-hmm. says that he spends some time with the people he loves, and like, so there's a panel with him with Jay, but there's also a panel where he's fighting alongside Damien, and I thought yep. it was kind of sweet as well, because he's his best friend. Yep. Uh, it's all really good stuff. Um so that's cool. Uh, the final page is kind of interesting. So it's whoever's stolen this LexCorp tech yep. that was being talked about earlier um, from police evidence or whatever it is. Uh, he's on a chat room basically saying, oh, we need to do something about the Superman. I can do something. He's not as special as he thinks. Uh, and he just sort of smiles at the end. Uh, and there's this... And I assume it's red kryptonite because there's a red glow coming from this case, and it's the yeah. way the way this character says I can make him less special makes me think he's going to try and take his powers away. Yeah. So with the red kryptonite, though, right? It's different than red sun radiation. Yes. Um. So there's something. Cause, this cause, is something LexCore has worked on. Yeah. Maybe. So, the, yeah. Maybe this is something that mimics red sunlight. I don't know. Yeah. So, but if it's red kryptonite, that has who knows. What the effect of that is, it's kind of a random thing. But what if it's something that Lex has perfected in Red Kryptonite? Sure. That yeah. makes it, you know, who knows? What I like here, though, too, is the chat room. If you read some of these names on here and what they're saying, Clark Kent. Uh, right. <laughs> Lex is right. Doomsday 88, which, if you know what 88 stands for on the internet, it's not good. Um, it's not a birth year, usually. So. Um, but it's like he led a group of terrorists I, into Gomorrah and overthrew the dramatically elected government. Um, what were you going to say, Pete? I actually don't know what AA means in the internet. What? So so <laughs> we'll just say that the if you take the eighth letter of the alphabet, which is which is H, mm-hmm. and you put two of them together, just do the math of what kind of groups would be using HH as a sign. Ah. Yeah, you know, as someone who's born in '89 and uses that, it terrifies me to think there's some innocent '88 people out there. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame that they have to go and ruin it for the rest of people. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> so now that might just be you know a coincidence. But knowing Tom Taylor and I'm, his oh, I'm sure it's intense. Interactions on the th- this is this is meant to be like eight Chan losers on this chat room. Yeah, so this exactly. is definitely what it's supposed to well, be going for. And that's just the part with the Clark Kent guy. It was like, oh yeah, he led a group of terrorists to overthrow a, demo- a democratically elected government. Who deposed the actual democratic leader, right? So it's all about that. So just the fact that he's going after these losers like this um, makes me love Tom Taylor. So, but yeah, I wonder what's going on with this Red Sin dude. He's wearing uh, green. He's got what well, looks like red earphones on. Um, yeah, so he's kind of Lex X. Yeah, they're they're that's, they're that's, they're hiding that's... his face though, which makes me think maybe as someone we will 
in some way recognized, perhaps, Maybe. when we actually see him. I don't Maybe. know. But I do remember Taylor saying this is John's like first like original villain because Bendix, mm. you know, for all intents and purposes, is a Wildstorm character. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if this is someone wholly new. Um, I can see that. Yeah, Red, yeah, Red Sin is a solid, solid Superman villain name. Just based off of nothing yet. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, no. Yeah, really see, enjoyable. No, I really enjoyed this issue. I think it's one of the best issues of this book that, that he's done. Um, seeing Tommy's art is pretty dependable. It's not my favorite in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, just little things like the faces aren't necessarily how I'd like them, but um, I do think the sense of motion when he's flying, I think that, that sequence of pages where he flies off and then eventually you know, lands in his father's arms, Like I think all that stuff looks yeah. great. Uh, so the big spectacle stuff looks good. Um, some of the you know, more down to earth, like just drama talking heads stuff is, you know, not mm-hmm. not the, the best. Like they, they can't all be Greg Smallwood is basically what I'm saying. Um, but still very good. The coloring of obviously is very vibrant as it should be in a Superman yeah. book typically. So, uh, oh, good. Uh, were you given the Superman son of Kal-El issue 16? I'm going to give this one 8.5. We, we, yes, I, I don't want to just keep picking the same scores as you, but I'm, I'm kind of tempted to just give it an 8.5 as well. Yeah. So, okay, 8.5 from me. There we go. Uh, there we go. All right, The Flash, 787, Jeremy Adams and Fernando Pissarin. Uh, so let me tell you something, Mean Gene, or Mean Bean, or whatever it was called. Mean <laughs> Bean and uh, Lawyer Justice. No, no, it was Justice, Justice Lawyer. Lawyer. Because it made Justice me think of Jerry Lawler. Lawler. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, so I don't know how much Jeremy Adams actually watches wrestling. However, However, there is a lot of fun 80s wrestling tropes in here. It felt, I don't know how much of the um, Southpaw regional wrestling stuff you saw from back in the day, uh, which is just like the silliest wrestling type stuff that you can watch. This felt very much in spirit with that, so I appreciate it for that. Um, but yeah, this was—I don't say it was a rough read. It definitely wasn't what I wanted in a flash-themed wrestling book. Um, but yeah, what do you think? Um, I mean, I—I I mean, I read this at the airport <laughs> the there other day, go. um, and it was a—it was a fun enough romp. I mean, it definitely felt like it was a you know. I want to say a fill-in issue, because it's... It, yeah. yeah. But it felt like, oh, this is just like a fun little thing to do for one yeah. issue between arcs. Uh, I, I did appreciate the whole Wally being overwhelmed with family life, superhero, the crisis, all this other type of stuff. And that wrestling is kind of the way that he is able to, like, process all this stuff by talking to not Hulk Hogan. Yeah, it's um, an alien who's but, very much based on Hulk Hogan. It's hard to yeah, know yeah. that. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, basically on the TV, Wham! comes on, which is uh, wrestling mm-hmm. across the multiverse. <laughs> and they're watching these alien dudes, like, fight out, but then it looks like they've, they've, they've fallen into, like, downtown Central City or wherever, and Wally sort of speeds off to go and deal with it. But he inadvertently pins one of them, so the ref bot mm-hmm. counts the three count, and yep. the other guy's like, oh, I'm pissed at you now, you just took my title shot. Uh, uh-huh. So then in comes in Purple Hulk Hogan. Uh, who is the Omega Bam Man? The Omega name too cracked me up. It's uh, uh I don't know. He, he's got kind of the mullet. He's got the mustache. Oh uh, yeah, he's just missing the 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 uh, bandana on his head. Yeah, you know? uh, I'm not sure how legally different they had to make it before. But yeah, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah. So they end up tag teaming, uh, mm-hmm. and then tag team against a couple of alien dudes. So Wally's actually the tag team champion by the end of the issue. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of a rub. I appreciate that it cut to Dick and Babs watching. I, I, did they always watch this wrestling show? To, I don't know. Yeah. Also, the idea that this Wham Wrestling is like an outlaw group and the Green Lantern Corps is honestly trying to shut them down. Yeah, but they keep that, moving so that no one can find keep, them. Yeah, that cracked me up. Um, and then seeing seeing Wally do a, a single leg crab on one of the guys. <laughs> That was, that was another fun. I never thought I'd see that in a comic. So, um, Yeah, there's not too much to say. I would say that no. the actual fighting, the wrestling itself, and the yeah. city street, uh, you know, they're a bit messy, those pages. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's got the best flow of any of the action sequences that we've seen in The Flash. Yeah. You know, it's very busy. 
Uh, the issue doesn't feel like super important by any means. I, I kind of appreciate that it's just a lighter romp, though, of an yeah. issue before we get back to other things. Uh, and you know, the kids being excited to see Wally, like you know, win the fight is 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 entertaining yeah. enough. But the one interest that I suppose it gets to a little bit is the idea that Wally kind of needs something that he just does for him because everything's either saving the world or doing stuff for the way for the kids. He doesn't really have a hobby that's just mm-hmm. his. And that's kind of what they are. She's like, hey, maybe it won't be wrestling long term, but at least for now, you're starting to enjoy this because it is just yeah. for the sake of it rather than... So, you know, it's just an interesting little yeah. angle to look at. Well, and it, and it kind of hits with that. I've heard, like, some of my friends that have kids, at a certain time, your life kind of just revolves around the kids and your hobbies and your stuff, you know, dwindle away until they're able to, you know, have their own hobbies and stuff. So I don't know if this is a meta commentary on something like that, but... I was picking up on on those threads, um, and then yeah, because like Wally not just as a superhero, but he was a mechanic too, you know. Mm. And we kind of get back to that sometimes, but we haven't seen him do that in a minute. So, you know, him having this hobby of maybe being a tag team champion uh, for wrestling across the multiverse, you know, seems that'd be a fun thread to pick up on in you know a year from now. Yeah, uh, but yeah, just kind of a the, mm. you know. Uh, a romp that isn't that important, uh, mm-hmm. but it was a decent enough read. Uh, yeah, I don't really have much more to add. What are you giving the, the issue about? I'm going to give this a, a seven. <clears throat> seven, yeah. I, I'll go just a touch lower and say 6.5 uh, for me. Uh, I, I think mm-hmm. it's a pleasant enough little sort of fill-in issue kind of thing, but yeah, uh, yeah you know, it, it is what it is. All right, Flashpoint Beyond, issue six. Jeff Johns, Jeremy Adams, and Tim Sheridan writing with Mikel Yannin as Manico on the art. So, all, right. a lot of big things. Thing in issue five. Let's get this out of the way. Thing in issue five. Okay, Jeff Johns casually <laughs> named the Joker. Okay. <laughs> we forgot to talk about this. Uh, so in issue Wait, he, d- he did? Yeah, in issue five, he casually mentions, um, I, c- I can't remember who said it, but someone looked to see who the Joker was on, like, on the Flashpoint Earth, like, because you know, obviously Joker is Martha, right? Right. But the guy who would normally be the Joker, he just casually mentions his name in issue five, and he's got like a wife and kid. It kind of basically it looked like the premise that Johns was going for is that the 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 guy from the Killing Joke, like this is him, okay. and but instead of like things going bad, he's with he, he stayed with his girlfriend and he's they had a kid. His, the yeah. family, right? Yeah. Because he, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. But they just kind of threw out a, a random name. And it's like, it doesn't really take away from the mystique of who the Joker is, really. But at the same time, it's kind of like a slap in the face. And it, like, no, like, not knowing who he is is kind of part of the, the charm. It's part of the, the mystery. Uh, oh, shoot. Yeah, Jack Oswald White. Shoot. I forgot about that. Uh, and he works at the Wayne Casino. Yeah, yeah. So Shoot. Well, I mean... In the sense of, of what Johns does with, you know, telling stories across different multiverses, you know, in the Flashpoint universe, that's the guy that would have become. But, you know, Flashpoint only exists because of hypertime. Because as we've learned in, was it this one? There's so many different things going on right now. The difference between hypertime and the multiverse. Whereas the multiverse is like, not quite what is, but different planets across the multiverse and universe whereas hyper time is decisions that create parallel universes and that's where flashpoint is i'm already um, like getting confused yeah. stop it <laughs> yeah so in in this anyways um i thought this really it gets very johnsy at the end with a lot of these easter eggs that we'll get to oh sure yeah that just get thrown in at the end but as for the story on what flashpoint represents and and why the Flashpoint universe was created, um, like again, and who did it? Oh, yeah, again. I thought it was, yeah, yeah. Well, it was all, it was all very fulfilling. Like I felt like, you know, this was a story that six issues ago we were kind of poking fun at, and seeing where the train wreck goes. It, yeah, it's funny because <clears> it's still you still have to get through some of that the earlier yeah. silliness and like what it's doing. Bizarrely though, like yeah, the final point it's made yep. about like. So the Time Masters are like, and we see more of that throughout this issue, yeah. kind of keeps cutting back to them, but mm-hmm. more of the Time Masters, like Batman's arguing with Rip Hunter and Corky, and they're like saying, hey, 
this snow globe, you've recreated the Flashpoint universe in there, so your yep. father from the Flashpoint universe can still be alive. He's rejecting everything. He knows something's mm-hmm. wrong, and that's what we've been seeing throughout the main story, is that he right. he's trying to like change the world because he thinks it's wrong that he exists. Right. Um, basically, Batman did all this, um, and he's, try- he's, he's fighting off the Time Masters because he believes that ultimately... Thomas can make a different choice by the end. That he, he's going to choose to be happy and do something for the right sort of, you know, reason by the to, end. To, to accept the fact that Bruce is gone. Yeah, right? And... Because, it, it, so it, it ties into the end of Flashpoint, which is, you know, we, we all saw that he got a letter from Thomas, but we never really yep. got to hear the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, this finally reveals what the, what the letter said, and the, yep. the gist of it and the, the important part of it was that Thomas, like, oh, finding out that there's a Bruce somewhere who is Batman, mm-hmm. like, I kind of, you know, it kind of made me realize who I am and what I do, and that you always want better for your kids than what you have. So the idea that you're just doing what I do is actually, like, right. you know, that's not what I want for you. So how about wherever I am, I'll promise to try and get over it and be better and happy if you try and do the same. So Batman's trying to give this Thomas Wayne, even though it's not really his Thomas Wayne, He's trying right. to give this Thomas Wayne a chance of doing that. And ultimately, at the end of the story, which is Thomas rejects breaking time to go and try and save Bruce and his timeline yep. with Martha to instead save uh, Harvey Dent's child, who he Dexter. realizes will be erased from existence if they change the timeline. So it's yep. about saving this kid instead of going back and selfishly saving their own that already died. Yeah. Honestly, thing, the, the, yeah. Like that's actually kind of heartwarming in a way that I w- I didn't see coming, and I was nope. like, I kind of like that. <laughs> Stop <Yeah>, bad. <laughs> I like that a whole lot, and the fact that like so so, Joker, you know Martha Wayne, is like, yeah, let's go. I killed all these time travelers, put together this time sphere. Let's go save Bruce. Let's mm-hmm. make sure this never happens. He's like, yeah, but if we do that, Dexter never exists, and I that whole moment when he comes to that thing and saves him from Gilda, him and Martha. It just, it was this culmination of stuff because I wasn't, I was loving the whole Dexter thread. Like the fact that he's taking this kid and that his, his Alfred, who's the penguin is teaching him all these it, bad things. You know, it's, it's suddenly mm-hmm. him not caring about Dexter the whole arc and just yep. saying penguin, take care of him. Yeah. And hindsight is a really nice little touch that the whole, ish, the whole arc, he didn't care about him. And right. it's only here at the end when, like, this kid's like, oh, wait, I won't get to exist. <laughs> right. Where he's like, oh, wait, no. Like, I it's, can be better than this. Yeah. Yeah, and just the way that they went with that, it was just... Was not expecting for Flashpoint. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, because so, you, you kind of feel like the whole time Batman's doing the Barry Allen thing where he's being selfish yeah. and trying to bring his father back. But yeah. in reality, what he's doing is he wants his father to realize that he can't go back and change things. That's the choice that he wants him to make the whole time. Right. Because it's because um, they point out that Flashpoint was created by Barry's grief for his mom, and him trying to change that, and that that's what they think that Bruce is doing, the Time Masters, and that whole discussion between Bruce and Rip, where Bruce is like, "You don't know everything you think you do," you know. I like that moment too, because as much as it 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 gets on the you know Batman has a plan for everything, mm-hmm. in this place his plan actually works out the way that he needs it to. Um, and that he proves the time owners or the time yeah. masters wrong. It's kind. It's kind of like they're putting uh, Batman's like planning and like uh-huh. figuring things out against actual time travelers who, in theory, should know yep. what's going to happen. Right. And it's kind of funny that Batman was right. <laughs> like yeah, he, pla- and, he, he planned for it. <laughs> right. Well, it's the fact too that he he's also putting all the hopes on, you know. Yeah, it, I think is Thomas's. It is Thomas's choice ultimately. I think that's that, why it doesn't feel like just like a, oh, it's yeah. because Batman. It's exactly. more about him having faith in someone else to make the right, right choice. So it's actually, even though he's technically right and he banked on something that turned out to right. be true, it was it, he banked on something that was like a, a hopeful thing. It was he was hoping yep. that his father would make the right choice, and that's what makes yep. it sweet. And then, and then even at the end, where they have Martha in the Batcave in a cell, yeah. <laughs> uh, because she is still the Joker, but they're going to try to fix her. And Dexter's you know? officially the Robin. And De- Dexter's Robin, and he's Batman, and they're going to yeah. go, you know be this crime fighting family for the flashpoint universe. Now, it, you know, it fits in with DC, you know, it's, it's one of these things where, yeah, we kind of, you know, flashpoint was a mess at points, but, but, you know, when King pulled out the, the Dr. Batman character 
and threw him into his whole run. It got even messier. Uh, and I love here that, that Sheridan and, um, and Adams and Johns are able to fold it back in with hyper time and whatever else and make it work. Yeah, plus, you know, like there's a lot of teases here towards the end for stuff that John's and maybe just other stuff mm -hmm. that he knows is going to happen soon. Yeah. And all the planning, because, you know, the Time Masters are talking about stuff um, and uh, the, the lady threatens Corky with like a timeout during Bloodlines. And I'm like, Bloodlines? Yeah. There's, there's, there's a story coming up called Bloodlines. So th these are things that John's loves to throw in. Uh, it also mentions that uh, Batman's going to have his hands filled with his mother's family soon. So again, they're teasing stuff that's coming uh, in the stories. So that's cool. So I, I took that as, is this the culmination of Ram V's detective? That the whole Arkham? Yeah. Because Johns did love, you know, in, in Earth 1. Um, was Earth 1? Is that the, the series? It's been forever. Uh, as Earth in two? the graphic novels? Yeah, the graphic novels. Earth 1, yeah. Yeah. That she was an Arkham. Um, but she's also a Kane. And I'm wondering if this, if this, you know, Arkham family that's coming mm. from across the seas somehow is related to her. Yeah, it could just be a tease for that. Yeah. Yeah. Which, if if so, cool, because they're they're tying all that in. Yeah. Um, but then you know these other time capsules that have failed, you know, they're being pulled back into history. Yeah. And this is stuff that they're trying to quarantine. You know. I, I assume from, this is, this is set up for GSA, right? This. Uh, I would assume so. Yeah. With, with these names, like the Golden Age, Mr. Miracle, right? The, the Golden Age, Red Lantern, yeah. Ladybug, Betsy Ross, Quiz Golden Kid. Age, Aquaman. Yeah. So it, it looks like a bunch oh. of Golden Age versions of characters yeah. that are probably going to show up in GSA. And yeah. then there's another tease at the end here with this. Uh, I mean, do you know who this character is? This young woman? No. So yeah. this this is the Watchmen universe, though, because that is... Yeah, the cat thing, yeah. Right, but not just that, but that's the nostalgia, right? And here the nostalgia spills, the, the, the scent. Yeah. And and yeah, so they'll have to go find the the Watchmen. And so this is where the Gary Frank art kicks in from Doomsday Clock. Yeah, there's two pages again, which makes me wonder, like, has he got a follow-up for Watchmen planned for some point? I don't know. I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to use another thing from Watchmen, so I'm right. going to tease it at the end of this. It's another thing to get Gary Frank back to do the two pages. Like, yeah. That suggests to me that there's right. well, plans. and again for for a follow up to Watchmen, right? I think Doomsday Clock is a pretty, pretty good, uh, like it's a very good story for a follow up to Watchmen. Oh yeah, I love but, Doomsday Clock, right? But it doesn't have to be centered around Watchmen. This feels very much, I don't say a sequel, but a new take on Watchmen because this is clearly another legacy character that is dressed yeah. in purple. We know Ozzy Mandius was in purple, so is this is this Ozzy Mandius's legacy? Is this the person that's going to kick off whatever else happens now. Well, I mean, and, well, there's a question though: is it a follow up to Watchmen or is it a follow up to Doomsday Clock? Because those are, right. I, think, I think those are two very different things. Well, when I say I thought I should say, is this a follow up to Doomsday Clock? Because I was going to bring up the the Doctor Manhattan kid. Yeah, I, I would be more, still floating around. I would be more inclined to say it's a follow up to Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock, right? Uh, because I do think that's a very different distinction. Uh, yeah. versus something like Tom King's Rorschach which is just a, right. a follow up to Watchmen so um, I am very intrigued by that if, if this is something he's he's building to um, obviously we got some GSA teases which makes sense because we know that book's coming I'm curious to see where this goes I would just say it's something else from GSA if it wasn't for the fact that he got Gary Frank back to just do these yeah. two pages the fact that he got Gary Frank back for these two pages makes me think there's a special project with him coming yeah well and the fact that they named up the Watchmen, right? Yeah. Like it's not the Watchmen. It's singular. Um, uh, does it involve the Time Masters? What's behind that field? You know, is is this person trying to free the original Doctor Manhattan? Right? Like, is this some mm -hmm. tiny wimey type stuff? Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I was stoked. I got to that Gary Frank art because I I saw his name at the front credits page. And I kept waiting. I'm like, when? Yeah. When's Frank know, coming? And then I, it was there. And I think, it looked like Doomsday Clock. And I got excited. I think these teases from John's are a lot more exciting because we know he's got another ongoing yeah. book starting. Because I think if he didn't, I would be like, oh yeah, but when's this ever going to happen? Because like, right. you know, when he did like that Stargirl one shot yeah. and it was like, oh, it teased some things. I'm like, yeah, but when? And you know, it's been so long and nothing still and happened. Uh, you know, and maybe he'll follow up on those stuff. Maybe he won't. You know, like, 
I feel like because we know he's got an actual ongoing book starting in the next month or two, and because he's got another miniseries starting, it feels like he's actually back in some capacity where yeah. he will actually keep making stories and will actually pay this shit off. And because of that, I can actually be excited about this, mm-hmm. uh, which is nice. But because yes. because if he, but if he didn't have those things, I'd be like, okay, this is great, but I'm not going to get my hopes up because you know he was so intermittent for for so long. Yeah. Uh, that it, it wasn't worth getting excited for anything after Doomsday Clock. But, uh, no. Uh, cool. But as someone who loves Doomsday Clock and loves GSA, I'm excited for yeah all these well, things happening. And just the idea, too, of the whole metaverse and what the metaverse meant to the JSA, as told in Doomsday Clock, they could be one part of the same thing at this point. So, I'm excited for whatever it is. I mean, I got really excited for those time capsule things. Because I love those little, you know, Easter eggs. It was like the um, when they hinted about the different Lantern Corps and the Major Green Lantern. You're like, oh, what's this? And it might ultimately be me building it up for something that isn't going to stick the landing. But the way it's presented here, it just it felt nice. All right. Uh, what are you giving Flashpoint Beyond issue six? I'm giving this an eight point five. Ooh. Oh, that's, uh, that's, yeah. I'm just going to go straight eight, I think, on this. Yeah. But it's definitely, it definitely conceptually turned into a really interesting story by the end, even though there was a lot of why are we doing this early on and a lot of weirdness to it. Uh, and some interesting teases. Uh, so I still say it's a bit messy overall, but I, I can't say that I wasn't into some of the concepts by the time we finished. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, Batman versus Robin issue two. Mark Wade writing with Muhammad Asar on the uh, Mahmoud Asrar. Mahmoud Asrar, sorry, uh, for the art. So that's right. Yeah, so this is a uh, continuing. You know, Alfred seemingly back with Batman. Uh, we get more of what Mother Soul's up to with Robin and all this shenanigans. So yeah. this yeah. book is weird, but in a great way. Mm-hmm. Because reading this, because I just refreshed because I read it last week. Um, trying to figure, or figure out, trying to remember what I read in this one was a tough go. Um, and then I got to the, the pages where they're in the House of Secrets or the House of Mystery. I can't remember which one. Secrets. And it just, House of Secrets. It gets so, so, so weird with these characters showing up and like the skull dude. Um, yeah, man, this is a lot of fun. You can tell that Mark Wade's having a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, he's pulling also some weird shit out. Uh, we get these characters going to Atlantis to like, steal shit early on. Um, these very magic-based characters, obviously. Uh, there's, there's a couple of more recognizable ones that show up uh, when they go back, like Clary and mm-hmm. um, and whatever. But this is all Mother Soul's doing, and Neza's actually using um, this young, who's this young character he's using? It's Black Alice. Black Alice, yeah. He's using yeah. her to, like, basically, so so two of the characters are stolen Ragman's quilt, right? And mm-hmm. they're basically sucking the magic out of magical items and putting it into Dr. Fate's helmet to, like, supercharge it. So they're making this ultimate Dr. Fate helmet. Um, obviously, they're clearly the reason why magic is completely wacky right now. That's something yep. that was brought up last issue. So, you know, it's building up more of this stuff. Um, and there's some uh, interesting tidbits. Uh, you know, Felix Faust is is having weird moments. Batman kind of has to grab him and stop him from doing anything. And that's when House of Secrets shows up and Batman and Alfred go in. Uh, and just a whole variety of wacky stuff in there where, where Batman gets to see some of the stuff that happened. It's, it's wonderful how much this is tying into the Robin book by Williamson, you know, and yep. he, he sees the tournament kind of be half, you know, fight fight playing out in yep. front of him and stuff like that. There's some interesting details in here, unless I'm mixing up my books, but I don't think I am, uh, where we get kind of an origin for uh, Lazarus resin. Uh, it seems yeah. to come, so it ties into the origin of Neza from World's Finest, which is, so the father who, like, you know, was it determined to find something to resurrect his son um, that is what kind of became the, the, the first version of Lazarus resin. And yep. Lazarus pits all kind of come from that source, which is very interesting because it's which, this very biblical story and, you know, kind of... Right, which which then inherently ties it to, um, 
like tie ties Roz as the demon, right? The head of the demon yeah. to the devil Nazar, uh, in his story, which I think is really cool. I like when they overlay the mythologies in DC yeah. on each other like that, especially when they fit so perfectly. So, um, so we have this yeah. very interesting thing where they've kind of like tied them together and. You know, that's why Mother Soul's, like, working with Neza, because actually, you know, that is kind of the demon itself, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you go back far enough, that's where it comes from. Uh, so, super interesting. A um, lot of wackiness with uh, them in these various scenarios and running into various characters uh, throughout. But, uh, yeah, like, Damien, uh, it turns out, you know, when he, we see, we see more of this play out, it turns out this all started because Damien, when he was exploring Lazarus Island after the events of his series, mm -hmm. he basically inadvertently opened the tomb that had Neza in it. You know, he opened it without knowing what was inside, yep. released Neza. Uh, obviously, Neza took control of him, and that's why Damien's the way he is in this book. Uh, and that ties into what we know about Neza, is that he can control people. We saw him control Superman even, so it's not like Damien's like some weakling for not doing this. Uh, but it turns out Damien's actually the one behind, like, Batman seeing all this stuff. Like, he's kind of puppeteering, like, yeah. seeing all this stuff. And, yeah, like, it, it just kind of escalated. It's, it's a really trippy kind of issue because there's a lot of, like, weird stuff to go through. But there's a lot of really fascinating little, like, reveals that happen throughout. Like the Lazarus resin stuff. Uh, like the reveal of how Damien opened the tomb. And Batman even seeing, like, Damien fight alongside his new friends. Uh, big stuff towards the end though is that Mother Soul gives Damien his Batman outfit because he's ascending um, to a new. Uh, so yeah, obviously it's smaller because he's still a kid, but it's yeah, it's the big collar kind of thing from Batman Six Six Six. Yeah, from Morrison. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, "What's a Batman without Robin?" So it looks like Neza might have taken control of Dick, Tim, Steph, and uh, Jason. <clears throat> Which you know, that's Dick Grayson in World's Finest. So True. that ties him back to the devil, Nazar. Um, but what got me here is is the last page. Right? Well, of, course, so, of course, yeah. There's the, so Well, the fact that they get out of the burning house of secrets, right, which the house of secrets is this weird, you know, they're, they're going through and they're falling through reality and they're running into these different characters of Cain and Abel and Cynthia and, and all, you know, all of this stuff. And they finally get out because they find out that, you know, Damien's the one that's puppeteering everything. Um, and that, you know, Bruce is happy to have um, Alfred on his side because he can always, you know, he always has an eye on Bruce. And just, man, Asrar killed this page right here. Just the, the ominous, you know, Alfred walking away from the burning House of Secrets and saying, that's what I'm here for in Shadow. But then his shadow on the ground looks like a demo, uh, demon itself. Was it the Devil Neza? I think. Neza has those big ass forms like that too. He does, doesn't he? I think so. Yeah. He uh, does. Yeah. It, so it's so funny because last issue we're so skeptical, skeptical, but there's yeah. that one moment near the end that kind of convinced us. Oh, maybe it really is Alfred. And then this issue just has to hit us with us at the end. It's like, no, it's not Alfred. This is this is an imposter. Well, how do we know that it isn't the real Alfred? But he now. Going to the house. Oh, no, now Nez has got control of him. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, you could be right. I feel like Mark Wade's good at throwing us for loops for certain things like that. Um, I, I still think it's not really him now, but I, I can totally buy that possibility. That it is really yeah. Alfred, but now he's under control of, of, right? of Nez. Because okay. there's a lot that goes on in that house that Damien puppeteered, you know? Although it would be up to Damien to, to bring Alfred back in the eyes of Bruce just to take him away again. Mm. Although, what would that do to Damien? Because as we saw in Williamson's, that, that was, you know, he wanted to bring him back via Lazarus. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe Alfred coming back is actually to do with Damien in the sense that, yeah. and let's assume it's the real Alfred for a second, which I'm not, I don't, right. I'm not convinced it is anymore, but okay. let's say it is. What if the reason why Alfred came back is because when Damien became connected to all this shit, we know that Damien internally has been longing for Alfred to come back and wanted right. to bring Alfred back. What if it just kind of like, subconsciously or like just by default did it once he was connected to all this that it brought alfred back because deep down that's what damien is really right. wanted so it's not something he did intentionally but it's kind of right. this like side effect of everything going on yeah no just the thought be. well that's why i want to believe it is the real alfred because i feel like it'd be cheap for it to not be 
I don't think it would be cheap at this point. Yeah. Uh, if anything, it's the more lately outcome that it's not the real offered. Which is which is why I was impressed by the end of the first issue that he was able to convince me that it might be really him. Right, right. So, you know, I, I think that's credit where credit's due, which will just make it hurt when it's not, effectively, right. which is nice. Right. Uh, Give him hope just to take it away. Which is what I feel at the end of this issue. I just kind of feel, I feel like this was like, oh no, it's not really him. He's just, yeah. he's just a monster in disguise. So. Yeah, so... You know, really, really, really solid issue now that I remember, because it's been a week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, over a week since I read it, but yeah. That yeah, was a good time. Uh, what are you reading it? Um, I'm going to give this an eight. Yeah, uh, I, I would uh, concur with that. Uh, Batman Superman World's Finest Issue 8, Mark Wade writing with Dan Mora on the art. So the other Mark Wade book, mm-hmm. World's Finest. Um, So, obviously this issue, we've been dealing with this new sidekick character who... Boy Thunder ends up being the uh, the name that's given to him. Uh, Dick jokes that that's practically trademark infringement, <laughs> but uh, the, the the other t- Teen Titans are like, nope, we're sticking with that. It's too good. There's no way we're not letting that go. Uh, so, yeah, you've got basically his story of like working with the others. Uh, Supergirl's there as well. Um, the big thing that happens in this issue is that the key has basically drugged everyone in Gotham so that they can't find their way out of wherever they are so they can't open any doors. That's basically like, you know, he's, he's kind of locked them all in but it's all like a mental thing. Yep. So Batman and Dick are also under the effect so they call in Superman uh, who brings in uh, Boy Thunder, Boy Thunder. To, to help with it. And so, you know, he, he goes around, he rips open some walls, he gets people out, Supergirl shows up to and the the whole big moment is, is that Boy Thunder's sent off on his own to help these miners who are trapped in the mine shaft. And there's a build up of methane, which normally is not that huge a deal. They, they, you know, they would just leave until it naturally passes, but they're stuck in there. Um, the door handle doesn't work, so it's like we're well, going to have to use your powers. Which we've seen throughout the issue, he he was practicing a little bit with the Teen Titans, and he was kind of starting to control it a little bit better. His blast, his energy release that he's doing. Uh, <laughs> I love that Roy points out, are we really going to call them hot flashes? <laughs> like, I thought that was real funny. Yeah, uh, but he's too scared to actually do it uh, at first. And he gets scared, he flies away and hides. But then he thinks about his home world dying, he thinks about someone that he maybe could have saved at the time and helped like get out under some rock that he maybe didn't. And this encourages him to like fly back and do it. Because, uh, Superman gets called in to go and do it because Batman thinks that Boy Thunder's given up. But when Superman gets there, he's opened the door, the workers, the miners are coming out, uh, he saved the day, it's yep. kind of a nice moment. And it's like, okay, cool. There is some implications towards the end, though, that maybe his power's, like, erupting like they do. I mean, he's starting yeah. to control them now, but he, he couldn't at first. Then maybe he inadvertently killed his parents uh, with his powers before he left. Yeah. So we're teasing some darker things there. Could could be some interesting details. Uh yeah. Blue Beetle ends up showing up to like disperse an anecdote for the uh, the keys, you know, toxins or whatever. <laughs> You're a hell of a chemist, Ted. Yeah, but it was your formulas. I thought that was a fun <laughs> back and forth. So yeah. Uh but basically they they they, they recognize Supergirl especially recognizes that um the boy Thunder here, uh of David these name is. Uh, like he's he's going through something, and Supergirl sort of talks about how she came to Earth and how she lost her, her family, and she wasn't a baby like Clark was. She was fifteen, mm-hmm. so she remembers all the people she lost. Um, and basically talks to him about survivor's guilt, which I thought was a nice little like heart to heart. Yeah, and also I like the idea that that Wade's taking that, which might be the one good thing from the New Fifty Two, that her survivor's guilt also turns to anger, because that that's what led to her being in the Red Lantern Corps. Mm-hmm. You know, that she's upset because she does remember Krypton, right? At least she remembers Argo City. It's the, it's the big key difference between them, yeah. which is why they, they should, you know, have right. this difference. But, but I, I like that they play on that, is that, that she's just, she has this this thread of anger through her that Clark just doesn't have. But here it's also this thing where she, she, mm-hmm. will simp- she, she will have a greater relation to this new character more than Superman right. does because it is closer to her own experience. Right. So obviously, this idea that he maybe killed his parents by accident before he left uh, is another element that she doesn't compare uh-huh. to. But that's you know that's something to because you know, there's that moment where she says, you know, what happened was not your fault, right? And then the way he just kind of lowers his head and says, right, after that one panel flashback, 
I thought was very effective. Obviously, Dan Mora is killing it on art. Uh, the whole thing's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Super sharp lines, very vivid colors from uh, whoever's yeah. in the coloring. Uh, it does feel like a lost story, right? Just just the whole vibe of everything here. It feels like a, a, a for sure, like Mark Wade uncovered the story and gave it to Dan Mora to draw. So uh, I do like that. Yeah. Uh, so... No, uh, the big the big final page or the ending is that the key goes back to whoever he's working for, which turns out to be the Joker, and uh, obviously you can roll your eyes, oh, there's the Joker in the story, but um, I have to admit, I did kind of get a little chuckle out of uh, Joker saying, a sidekick, you say, I do like sidekicks, they're so delicate, <laughs> I don't know, that could be a laugh. Which at this point, Jason hasn't been robbing. That's true, that's true, he's not so, done that yet, yeah. So how many sidekicks that has he killed? Is that just that whole list? that Johns gave us and they're all just they've just been jokerfied oh you maybe know? I don't know but so, I don't know. Yeah. give me a, a, a chuckle uh, I, I think I'm kind of okay with it because I kind of like the idea of seeing some Mark Wade Joker mm -hmm. in action because he's having so much fun making all this feel kind of yeah. kind of silver well, agey with the, the high concepts you know yeah. kind of into it well he also he made the key so creepy right so it's just the idea of him with the Joker too and then Dan Mora just that last page he looks positively unhinged yeah one of the things yeah. that was going down like when the uh, the Gotham city like siege because he's doing it for ransom he's like give me five billion dollars yeah. and I'll uh, I'll you know release the locks it. as it were yeah. um, it, it shows you a couple of like, when Superman uses his x-ray vision you see that people are in a hospital and they can't get to the patient on the operating table because they're in a different room they can see him through the window but they can't actually get to him because they can't open the door uh, so it's like okay so that's that's why Superman and Cole go to the hospitals first because of the places that are you know people are you know not everyone's at immediate risk being trapped right. in whatever room they're in, but well yeah and then like Superman goes and starts lasering holes in in buildings so they can get out yeah 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 which again not something you want to do for every building because like people in their house you know they're, they're fine for a few hours yeah not a big yeah. deal but. Um, but, you know, like the firefighters that can't get into the burning building. Of course, that, yeah, that's yeah. Crazy, that. Oh, yeah, that was a really, like, almost dark thing, is the idea that they're just outside watching someone burn yeah. because they can't go in. That, that's actually quite a fascinating and dark. Yeah. Uh, and what is otherwise a very fun, pulpy comic. But this arc is sort of, like, talking about this this kid who's, like, again, survived some kind of form of, not genocide, but, like, a, of a, you know, apocalyptic event. <laughs> so interesting yeah. uh you know I, I think it's cool what he's playing with here uh what are you giving world's finest issue eight i'm giving this one because of the fun story and because of the, the art a nine uh I, i'm going to go 8.5 so i'm also bumping up there from, you go i think it's better than batman v's robin but uh mm -hmm. i'm just gonna be a smidge under you but i, I think the art's gorgeous damn what yep. has not disappointed just seeing him draw these different characters yeah is is really nice um and then of course there's the story i, I think it's doing some interesting things with this new character mm -hmm. but uh by and large it's just uh fun to see mark wade play with the toy box a little bit i guess so cool all right bad girls issue 11 becky Clooney and michael conrad writing with neil gouge on the art so i'm reading this one uh this is from last week um this uh we still have the serial killer on the list uh, more and more, you know, it seems like it's Riddler, uh, but we have like a vigil outside, we got Steph and Cass watching to try and keep safe that like, the killer shows up. Um, but, yeah, no, this was a solid issue. You have Montoya freaking out about the, the killings, and she's determined not to ask any Bat family members for help, but there's a, a, a cop who, like, sneaks up to the roof and actually turns the Bat signal purple to specifically call Batgirl, so Bab shows up and goes, oh, purple's a nice touch. And uh, he's like, look, here's everything we have. Because we, we know Bab's from the previous issues wanted to look at all the clues that the killer left. Uh, so this guy gives her all the details. And she's like, hey, next time you can just use this phone. And gives him a phone. And he's like, wait, next time? So it seems like Bab's is kind of like making herself a new Commissioner Garden for, you know, as it were, for herself. Uh, which could be a fun time. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, a lot of this issue, though, is actually some downtime where Steph and Cass are going to the zoo and Steph's invited along the guy, Kyle, that she met at the library. 
and he brings i think it's his little sister who's called maps uh who's a total nerd uh but she's really like she gets along re- really well with Cass. She pl- she plans out everything, and she's even planned when the uh, the the employees at the zoo change shifts and stuff, so they can go through secret areas without being spotted. Uh, so she's a little bit of a nutcase, but she's so enthusiastic about everything and seeing all the animals that uh, it's kind of endearing. Uh, while Steph is uh talking to uh, Kyle and they're having their their meet cute style moments. I will say, like, I think the art does a decent job of keeping up the, uh, the the style and tone of the book. I do think the daytime stuff at the zoo maybe suffers the most because it goes a bit flat. The colors are a bit more muted. It doesn't quite have the same pop and vibrancy that most of the book usually does, even under Guji's art. Here, I felt like uh, Steph's face in particular when she's just in, like, her civvies, it kind of feels like it becomes more of a, a different art style almost than uh to the, to the point where there's a couple of panels where I, where I actually said to myself who's this guy and it turned out it was Steph because I don't know I was getting like a like long-haired surfer dude <laughs> from her <laughs> so you know I I do have to critique the art a little bit uh in that sense uh but you know it's it's, it's pleasant enough I, I actually cast with the little sister uh was a lot more fun because it, it felt kind of like a mini Cass in a lot of ways, and Cass was kind of like starting to like her. Uh, they end up finding Firefly in like a cave, and Cass like puts on just her cowl with a cape uh, to go up and check check on him. Um, and uh, tur- it turns out that you know uh, Riddler's been I don't know been mean to him or whatever. Uh, but yeah, so Maps is like. Um, you know, like, I won't tell my brother about anything. And she's like, hey, was that Batman stuff? And she's like, yeah, it was Batman stuff. Uh, and you helped me, so thank you. Uh, so it feels like Cass is getting this little, not sidekick per se, but just, just someone that she can kind of relate to. Uh, and she's like, hey, are we best friends now, Cass? Or maybe second best friends, because she already has mm. Steph. Um, I don't know, it was all very sweet. That's funny. It was all very sweet and likable. Um, and the Batgirls are kind of looking at the clues and stuff. Um, but yeah, but they basically to figure out what, where where he was staying, um, and they actually go in and confront Riddler without like chasing all the clues that he's left behind, uh, which just really upsets them. Uh, one of the things they find actually is that the apartment they go to belongs to a woman, but the woman, if she's still alive, is one hundred and seven years old. So it kind of sounds like someone's been keeping the paperwork going, even though she's dead. And sure enough, they actually find her just sitting in the attic. A, a skeleton, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just sitting around. It's like, okay, alright. We're having fun. Um, but yeah, R- Riddler's all like, oh, you're supposed to follow all the all the clues to get to me, not just like sneak in like this. Um, so he's kind of pissed about that. But uh, yeah, so it ends with a fire of them confronting Riddler. Uh, and he basically threatens to kill them. Uh, you know, it's I had a decent bit of fun with this issue. I don't think it's as solid as the last couple that I really, really enjoyed. Um, I think part of it is because the art at times feels a little bit flatter. Even Riddler on the last page, it feels like he's he's got a really flat, cartoony face that feels very different uh, to like what the book's been up until this point. Um, don't get me wrong, the, the book's always had kind of a cartoony look to it. That's kind of part of the charm of it. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, well, Gouge did a good job of mimicking what the book felt like before his first couple issues, it feels like it's maybe transitioned a little bit to just being more like Neil Gouge's normal art, which mm-hmm. I do think is a little disappointing just because it was so stylistic before and had a lot of angles to it and sharp edges and kind of a pointiness to it that kind of made it feel like its own vibe that uh, this feels a bit more muted and just kind of I don't know, typical I guess but um, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy the issue though, I'm enjoying these characters I, I like the like Babs getting the new ally in the police force is kind of a fun little bit uh, Cass having this new sidekick in Maps who I hope comes back and has more mm-hmm. stuff with her I think should be a, a, a good time uh, Riddler being a serial killer, I don't even know how I feel about that necessarily. I think part of it's a timing problem. This being just a little bit after that Riddler one bad day issue kind of hurts it because there's no way it's going to live up to the Riddler in that version. So 
Mm -hmm. you know, it, it kind of hurts by being this cartoony version of him. Uh, so close to that. But um, that said, though, I would probably still give this a, a reasonable 7.5. Uh, just, you know, art's maybe not quite up to what it could be, and definitely is more of a, a downbeat issue in some ways. But, you know, it's still, still a solid part of the run, so 7.5 uh, is what I'd give it. Uh, there was actually, I want to say like, there was a little bit of narration, which it was definitely, there wasn't much of it, which is good because it's not been that great, typically, is the third person narration. But there was one little bit in here that I actually kind of liked, if I remember right. Um, yeah, where was it? Oh, I'm forgetting now. Uh, because I hadn't there hadn't been any in quite a while, and then it just kind of came in towards the end, and it was kind of like a, a a nice witty sort of coming of it. I I don't know. <laughs> I I can't find it. So you'll just have to take my word for it that there was a a fun beat in it. But uh, yeah, yeah, decent stuff. So there you go. That's Batgirl's issue eleven. Batman The Night, issue 10, Chip Zarsky writing with Carmine DJ Domenico on the art. So, this is the final issue. Uh, the front cover definitely made me think, oh, are we ending this with the bat coming through the window? Because that's what the, the, yeah. the cover is. Not quite that. Actually, the last few pages were very Batman Begins, I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because he says it's time to begin, which made me think of the movie, but also yeah. it kind of felt like the last scene in this was the scene in Batman Begins where he's out of the cave and just stands as the bats are swirling around them yeah it felt very I, felt much like that i really i thought it was gonna end right right before he gets on the plane with alfred sure yeah and you know but it goes one step with that thing but man zadarsky and batman is a, is a really great combination because i felt this pulled all those threads together even in that very rough first issue with with hugo strange mm -hmm. this pulled all his threads through the other nine issues together to, to give us a satisfying ending, which I've talked about in comics sometimes, like, with the exception of some of these miniseries or, or series like Rorschach or whatever, it's hard to stick the ending, or it's hard to stick that landing for a, a fulfilling ending. And I feel Zadarsky did here. Yeah, but the other Batman Begins parallel is that, you know, this kind of involves Bruce, like, <laughs> rebelling against Raz al Ghul and burning down his building. <laughs> yeah. that that my house. Yeah, that, that happens uh, again here, where mm -hmm. it turns out Raz, after Bruce has won the fight with, uh... What's his, what's his face? Ghostmaker. <laughs> okay. uh, after he's won the fight with him and he's going to be the heart of the demon, uh, he's like, oh, it turns out Raz is is uh going to launch these missiles to like sort of force cities into like under his control yeah he's cleansing them of fire yeah is what he's doing yeah it's, it's a straight up it's, terrorist it's a little bit different than the batman begins yeah tear, obviously yeah his tear gas yes yeah, so right? always plans um, a little bit different but the yeah, idea but, that bruce then fights back and burns the place mm -hmm. down but the thing that i liked about it in here that's unique to this versus batman begins yeah. is that a lot of his narration building up to this is that he's been so just searching for things up until now mm -hmm. that for the first time he feels like he's got a plan and he likes that. He feels power in that. I also like, even though it's a little on the nose, he talks about how he goes to this cave where Raz is to like do yeah. his thinking. And there's something about planning in a cave because a cave's like one of the, 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 the most unplanned things on it. You know, it's, it's this natural just like formation right. of it's, it's shapes and sizes. Creating, yeah, versus a man-made like, because all of all of Roz's crystal structures are all inherently man-made. Yeah, they're all crafted and architected. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And We're... this cave is just nature, and that he feels kind of in touch with the earth because he's under there, away from prying eyes. So, so it sets up that he's going to be what he'd be in a cave, of course. But yep. just that that juxtaposition of having him form strategy and plans, right. uh, and like in a place where there is no plan, it's, it's kind of a nice like sentiment there, but. He, right. uh, you know, he ultimately puts his plan into action because he's like, yeah, he already knew Raz was up to like all this bad stuff. So he blows up the missiles so he can use them. Um, there's even a point where he hangs upside down. It's very Batman-like and he's ninja outfit. It's just really nice stuff. Um, and the little swerve here is that he is kind of like left for dead at one point as all the fire's going mm -hmm. on and he's fighting Raz. And it's Ghostmaker who comes back for him and saves him that means he gets to live. So... It's like, okay, that's a little different uh, to, to the norm. But, you know, in many ways, like, when you talk about this is, like, th this entire miniseries is taking that time that Bruce traveled training to be Batman uh, mm -hmm. 
and just turning that into like a full-fledged story so you can uh, effectively you could just read year one after this and it would follow on relatively well mm-hmm. um like that's what this is and the fact that it even like, incorporates some of batman begins into i think intentionally I, I think the use of the word begins is very you know it's time to begin yeah I, it's that is definitely that, movie, that, is that a, movie's part about lore now yeah yeah right? it's or a tip like of the hat not. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a tip of the hat to that. It is, yep. you know, the, like I think you know, this always had to build up to like him with Raz Al Ghul. That had to be the ending, right? That had to yeah. be the final chapter in this, this journey around was, the world. I was waiting for it from the time he got to the sensei. Yeah, in in the mountains, and I was like, I feel like Raz is around the corner, and it took like another five issues, and it yeah. So I mean, by it being very fulfilling, it felt the story like. We all kind of, we all know where it was going because this is a, a prequel kind of story, but the way that it got there, I wasn't expecting. Like Kim and Ghostmaker, kind of teaming up uh, one last time, uh, to because for as bad as Ghostmaker can be in wanting with human life, he doesn't want what Ra's al Ghul does. No, no. <clears throat> so. This is why he commit genocide, which is a pretty right. big uh, difference. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's really sweet though, because he's he's going back to the house and he's kind of like, mm-hmm. I don't care if Gotham rejects me, but if Alfred rejects me, that's a problem. <gasps> like you know that 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 matters to him. And yeah. Alfred obviously hugs him immediately, and uh, he tells Alfred about his journey and his travels and everything. Um, but then he, he lies in bed and goes, you know, this is this man made bed. It's comfortable. It's sleek. It's the, it's the mm-hmm. bed of a rich man. Uh, and that sort of leads him to when Alfred comes to get him, he's not there. He's down in the cave, and that's the final page: is him being surrounded by the bats. Now, obviously, this doesn't do the the fear thing with Batman Begins, where he's like overcoming his fear in the cave with the bats. But right. uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the exact same. But it definitely there was yeah. a lot of things in this last issue that made me think it begins. Yeah, well, and, and just the idea of him like it's bringing back to the idea of a knight of all this training is his armor to to protect him from you know everything else um so you know by the time he's in that cave he's kind of he has his armor on yeah and you get the sense that this uh, final you know final scene this final page mm-hmm. is him realizing the idea of the bat like he's, he's not yeah. had that idea yet he's not obviously right. he knows he wants to fight cry but he's not had the idea of dressing like a bat yet right and right. that was never going to be what this was really about this is a nice little tag no. at the end but that's what yeah. batman year one and other stories do you yeah. know that's what and, and i'm glad we didn't get the him sitting in the chair with ringing the bell you know <clears throat> i like the idea that this is him hoping that that alfred is still there for him uh because yeah. you know that i mean i wouldn't have minded if like there was a quick montage of him going out you know that first time in year one and then he's sitting there yeah. in the, the seat if you wanted to end it with the bat coming through yeah. the window i would have understood that as a yeah as a of final course. beat but I i'm glad they they had some restraint and ended it with that yeah cave but yeah man so dark skin batman it's, it's a great combination right now uh I'm, I'm happy to have stuck with this yeah yeah uh so now that's that brings an end to the 10 issue book uh obviously mm-hmm. uh g domenico art there's not a whole lot to say because it's you know it's been very consistent throughout yeah um if anything i think it maybe even got a little bit better here just in the sense that i think it when it comes to Batman, it probably lends itself better to the darkness. So when he's like upside yeah. in the ninja outfit and things like that, it looks really good. Um, yeah, him, him in the ninja outfit, Roz and all that, and Ghostmaker. I feel like that's where Gia Domenico was really thriving. Yeah, I, I think Gia Domenico is less of a standing around and talking heads type of yeah. artist. He's, 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 oh, he's, for sure. He's less about subtlety, more about cool moments. I would say. Yeah. Well, that's why we enjoyed him on Flash so much. Yeah, because there was emotion and a fluidity. Yeah. To everything. Yeah. All right, uh, Batman and Eight issue ten. What are you giving it? Uh, an eight. Yeah, uh, I think I will agree with the eight. Uh, it was really good, and uh, not the best issue, just because that issue and the you know the cabin the and the snow yeah. was was fantastic, but really good. All right, cool. Uh, GCPD, the Blue Wall issue one, John Ridley, John Ridley writing with Stefano Raphael on the R. So, um, I really want to check this out. I almost didn't have time, uh, but Matt was running late. Uh, <laughs> so, I was like, oh, I can, I'll stick another book in. Why not? Uh, so, this is John Ridley, who we just talked about earlier with the Penguin issue, but obviously does I Am Batman and you know, whatever. Uh, this is, obviously, you might hear the title and go, is this like a GCPD book? Um, 
kind of. It's so Montoya's in it, and Montoya's the commissioner. It starts with her giving a speech to the new cadets who are graduating and are about to become police officers. And then our other main characters, uh, the main one is uh, Park, who is a young woman who is a new police officer, and then her two friends from the academy uh, are are the two characters that we kind of follow. Uh, but she's the main one. Park is the main one we follow, and Park looks up to Montoya and kind of respects her and is inspired by the fact that she be- she was this beat cop who became a detective who then became commissioner. Um, and Montoya is like seeing Two Face like in the streets when he's not really there. She's having these like moments where she's seeing him. Uh, but th- this you know this is clearly a hard hit. And there's actually a disclaimer in the first page about using racial language. I don't think I remember any from this issue, but there's a disclaimer which clearly means they're going to do it at some point in, in the book, and they're setting you up for that here in issue one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is very much about Montoya struggling with her job, but more so the idea of like Park going through her like, okay, you're a rookie, you've got all these noble ideas of what you want to do as a police officer, but there's a lot of, you know, elements to it that you don't predict. There's, there's you know, maybe we'll get to some corruption. It definitely sounds like the older cop that she's paired with is like, ah, oh, stop looking so naive on the world, like, get some sunglasses, because if you look at this world for too long, you'll go blind. There's this kind of separation, you know, at one point they get a description of a suspect in the car, and it's like, young black male, 15 to 17, where, with a red hoodie, potentially armed, you know, proceed with caution, and she's like, hey, that describes, like, half the people in this district, what the hell? And the the guy's like, ah, oh, well, this is just, you know, we just do the job, it's, it's for the DA afterwards to to sort out any mess. And the big plot point in this issue is that she, they just start chasing after this guy. She's not convinced it's really him to begin with, but this guy starts running because he gets scared and she chases after him and she pulls out her gun and this guy goes for his pocket and it's at this moment where she's probably going to have to fire. And then we, when you turn the page, it turns out that she didn't fire and that the kid was only reaching for his phone so he could film the cops because he thought he was being harassed. And... <sighs> The, the So the actual story of this issue is that once this happens, is that the higher-ups in the police force want to use this for publicity, because this is like, oh, see, she's a great cop. She didn't fire on this kid, and she could have, and it would have been justifiable. She made the right choice because he was innocent. And she feels guilty about this. Park is, like, tormented by this, because she didn't choose to not fire. She just froze. She got scared and froze. She didn't, like, make this choice in the moment that, no, I'm not going to fire because this kid's probably innocent. Uh, she just, you know, she doesn't feel, you know, she starts being touted as this hero in the press and that she's this great new example of what the modern police force should be. And she's like, I'm a fraud. And she tells her friends this, but she doesn't have the balls to tell Montoya. Um, it's a really interesting book. It really feels like Ridley's tackling a, like a, you know, a tough subject here that he really wants to talk about and explore and about like how a new idealistic cop might get like, you know, burned out and like very quickly, like you know, assimilated into the system that is what it is. Um, and there's some really big moments where early on, like one of our friends who graduated became a parole officer uh, and is like giving advice to like this young kid who's like just back out in the streets and he's like trying to give, you know, help and stuff. Um, and he's, yeah, he's saying things like, uh, you know, like don't be a statistic, you know, try and be good and all, all the rest of it. And, his like partners like giving him shit for even attempting to make that kind of like connection with his uh with his parolees or whatever. Um and there's a big thing later on where Park's in another situation and she hears a gunshot, she runs down the street and she's chasing the perp. It turns out to be this kid that her friend was trying to like help re- rehabilitate. And the cop that was with him was saying, Ah, oh, I give it a month before we pick him up again. And like the parole officer guy is like, no, I'm trying to like, you know, actually rehab people and give them a chance. Um, but there's this really sad part where now this kid immediately was involved in a shooting, and he's pulling out a gun on Park, and Park again freezes, and this kid with the red hair actually shoots another like an innocent civilian, and like you know that's the big cliffhanger is that Park once again has been involved in an incident, but this time her freezing has let someone innocent be shot. So it's definitely dealing with like these harder, tough issues about policing and it's using Gotham as a like a conduit to do it. But it definitely feels like no, this this is something that Ridley wants to really talk about and explore. Uh and you kind of feel that right from the get-go that he's there's a lot of ideas get into this. 
Uh, so I, I would definitely recommend... Obviously, it's not a book that seems to have sold that well, just because it is this smaller miniseries uh, that's not really about a Batman character. I mean, Montoya's kind of a Bat character, but only very tangentially. Right. She's on the outer rims <laughs> yeah. of it. But, like, it is a serious little comic book about a, a subject that I think it seems to be handling quite well um, with these, like, young rookie cops. You know, it reminds me of something like Serpico or something like that where... You know, the, the, these young cops who have got these ideal, I'm going to be a good cop, I'm going to, like, help people. Uh, the phrase to serve and protect is brought up a lot in this issue, and, like, not even just in, because it's brought up, but it was brought up in ways that characters are talking about what it means, and kind of, like, the... I don't know, some of the, the hypocrisy with it, and, so, you know, just... It, it, it's a very interesting examination of... uh Like, the young cops with the older cops, and kind of their attitudes on the world around them. Um, and maybe examining how we get into certain situations. Uh, so I'm very fascinated to see where it goes. I'm definitely up for reading issue two. Um, it went, it, you know, it's one of those books where it's mostly new characters who aren't like you know big bombastic superhero characters. They're just real people. Uh, and mm -hmm. as a result, it feels a lot more grounded and down to earth. Uh, the fact that it's in Gotham is basically irrelevant at this point. It's not like some villain shows up. Like you know, Gotham Central did that, where it was like, oh, this is this is more realistic cops in a world with Mister Freeze. This doesn't seem to be doing that, at least not yet anyway. Maybe it'll do something later on uh, towards the end or something. But right now, this is kind of like this interesting exploration. Um, so, no. Uh, I, I would recommend it. And they are actually, I think it's really, I didn't really know who Stef St Stefano Raphael was. Um, it definitely has a very <clears throat> grounded kind of element to it. There's a lot of muted colors. Uh, the, the line work, there's a lot of good expressions on the faces. It's the sort of thing that you'd maybe expect to see in like an image book or even in like a, you know, a crime book. Like I, I could see, I don't know, um, like Brubaker being paired with this artist and it, it, it working quite well, you know? Like it, so much of it, because it is more down to earth characters, it has to actually have performances from them as opposed to just having big bombastic action sequences. Mm -hmm. And I think it constantly gets body language and facial expressions right. And that really enhanced reading it because it it constantly felt like I was really watching a good drama as opposed to yeah. you know something else you know so I, I would highly was, recommend it. Yeah. You you talk about like teaming up with Brubaker. That's Brubaker and Lark. They nail that. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm Gotham not... Central and Lazarus. It's the body language and facial expressions. Yeah, I'm not saying that it looks sell like everything that's going on. Yeah, I'm not saying it looks like that little lark, but it's definitely no. it's achieving a lot of the same things. Right. So yeah, I would recommend. I I, I might give this an eight out of ten. I think this is a really oh, really shoot. strong issue. I uh, might have to revisit this. Maybe I'll pick it up if my store has physicals. Because mm. uh, I I had things to work this week. I didn't even get to my comic shop, so I'm all yeah. on digital this week. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I. I uh... It's one of those things where, like, I, I had hopes for the premise because any time you do like, just like a cop drama in Gotham, it's kind of like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would definitely look into this, and I think maybe, maybe the one part where it is going to become relevant is like Montoya being haunted by the ghosts of her past. Uh, is, is going to like you know be be the relevant sort of Gotham side of things, but uh, very interesting. But maybe maybe it'll say some interesting things about uh morality in the police force, you know, and maybe maybe it'll bring in the vigilantes and how. You know, this world gets to like skirt around it in a way that the real world can't, and that that can be mm -hmm. hard hitting on its own right. But uh, no, cool. Mm -hmm. nice. All right. Deceased War of the Undead Gods issue three. Tom Taylor writing with Trevor here saying on the art. Uh, yeah, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> yeah, this is. Yeah, I forgot we had this book. Shoot. Um. Did you read that? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I okay. read this one. All right, I just, you know, we, we said that. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I'm forgetting that we have. Yeah. It just keeps going and yeah, going and okay. going. But there's only one more after this, Matt. Yeah. So we're, yeah, I know. We're nearly this, <laughs> this goes to some world building pieces I wouldn't oh my God. for the third part in a trilogy. Yeah, th this is kind of wild. So the premise of the first half of this book is it's basically explaining... Uh, Adam Strange, and he's you know, he's in the Ran Thanagar War. Uh -huh. He's helping he's helping Ran fight. And the premise of this first half is that the spread of this uh, zombie virus got to the new gods because Adam Strange basically Zeta beamed back to Earth 
after the, the zombie apocalypse happened, mm-hmm. ran into Wonder Woman quite quickly and got transformed. But he'd already like programmed his uh, jetpack to go to where the next Zeta Beam was, mm-hmm. so that when that happens, he beams back to Ran and single-handedly infects Ran uh, with the zombie virus. And, and Thanagar, right? And, th- and Thanagar, yeah. Because it, of the war that's going yeah. on. Yeah, so that spreads to Thanagar, and then that spreads, you know, so th- this is basically explaining how it spread to a lot of the the, the galaxy, right? Is uh, yeah. uh, th- th- So I just thought all of this was, fa- this, this is like the first half of the issue, and I thought this was such a fascinating dark take that the Zeta Beam just automatically brought him back to another part of the, the, the universe, and that was that part of the universe road. Uh, just instantly, that's them. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that was a great first half of the issue. Uh, and then you've got Lobo being recruited to fight uh, all this shit. <laughs> In I, the next little chunk. I do love Tom Taylor giving us, like, guys that, like... I normally would want to read in something like this, like Lobo or Deathstroke, mm. and they're immune to the virus because of their healing factor you know so this reminded me of the deathstroke scene in in the second part um remind me what that was called oh uh unkillables yeah Um, so killables yes unkillables where he basically blanks out for a hot second and then resets and he's fine and here a thanagarian busts into the bar that lobo's at scratches him and is like you can't be changed um so I thought that was a really cool moment. It's going to give, Which you know... Makes him Lobo. indispensable in this fight. Right? Because he's, he's right? protected from it, yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, we had another good moment that they're at uh, Wonder Woman's funeral on Themyscira. Yeah, um, I, I really liked that Oliver and Artemis uh, yes. both, both fired the flame arrows to, to light Wonder Woman's boat on fire. Yeah, I, I like that. And then Hades shows up and Apollo kind of gets mad because it's like, how dare you come to a, I mean, a warrior piece? What? I mean, Ares. Ares, that's what I meant. Ares Hades, comes. which I think is uh, different. <laughs> they are, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ares comes and, and pisses off Apollo because, like, you're you're the god of war. You come to a, a, a warrior of peace's funeral. And he's like, you know, this is bad. And takes him into the Hall of Gods. And there's Apollo's bow there. And uh, Ollie's like, hey, can I use this? And... Uh, uh, Ares is like, yeah, like the end of times is coming. Why not? He's like, can I make adjustments to it? He goes, that's Apollo's bow. It's perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Ollie's like, no, it's a little top heavy. And Ares is like, yeah, you can make some. It's just these little fun moments that Taylor sprinkles in that make, you know, the end of times is coming, but Ollie can still, you know. Yeah, basically, there's like stories of the last time this happened and it ended yeah. the universe. So, the, like, this, you know, it's all happened before. Mm-hmm. And then this universe, like, you know, happened afterwards. Because yeah. uh, he opens up the book at the end, which is very Book of the Dead, and it says uh, Erebus on it. So, right. uh, so, a simple Google of Erebus. This is why I accidentally said Hades. There you go. Um, Erebus is the personification of darkness and one of the primordial deities. So, there is, you know, Erebus is one of the primordial gods of times before, which sounds an awful lot like the darkness mm. that's being weaponized by uh, Pariah in uh, in uh, Dark Crisis. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, yeah I, like, I don't think they're going to play into each other, right? Because this is no, I don't been think off so. And stuff. But the idea that Taylor's using a similar concept for the end of the, you know, line here and that they have to get everything together yeah all, all, the, all the lanterns are being called in to, uh, yep. to like plan an attack and all the rest of it i think the thing i like most about this issue is just you know adam strange gets beamed back to earth and he goes and he's like wait what the hell happened here what what, what mm-hmm. you know because it's, it's the zombie apart he's like uh what's going on like why why is everything look like it's uh in a wasteland what's happening i i just thought that was a great little touch uh an idea again it's just another example of taylor using so many of these characters in these unique situations mm-hmm. and like it's like oh this well, is a fantastic idea and and we don't we don't know right we just know it was two months ago right when yeah. it starts and that they're fighting the thanagar war and uh he gets being back and uh wonder woman's just like waiting for him like not actually waiting for him no, she's just flying through the sky yeah, yeah but she, he's in the wrong place at the absolute wrong time and just yeah. the way that she puts her fist through him, and and this is obviously this it's is gutting. This is pre cure, <clears throat> right? You know, it's pre her death. So, um, 
No, I, it's just a really interesting stuff. I, I think there's been a lot of unique setup here. Obviously, Corrigar fell last issue, yep. which is kind of what's inspired the Guardians to sort of take this seriously and get all the lanterns on board. Um, obviously, we have this dark side coming who's infected with it. So it's doing a good job of building up. Uh, if anything, this definitely feels like the most epic of the the, the three main parts. Yep. Because it's kind of like treating it like this big galactic thing where it's not spreading throughout the universe. <laughs> so even though there's a cure, there's still this huge fight to potentially go down with it so yeah um and, well, now, and that's and now we found and now we found out that this wiped out civilization on the entire universe before, before. before. yeah and that the idea that the god of war is the one that is the one that remembers right because that it was such a huge event that it's baked into him you know the whole concept of uh aries uh you know i like that meta commentary here so mm. but yeah um super, super good issue like that like you said the first half of, of how it's spreading and then we get to lobo which i shouldn't use the blanket i don't like lobo because i like when he's used you know sparingly uh here in these type of big events like here in 52 stick out the most um but like he actually has a purpose right here as being someone that literally can't die so how would a a, a um unliving virus affect him I think that's super cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Will you give it a map? I'm going to give this an an eight. Yeah. I'm eight gonna, I would give it an eight as well. I, I think I, I really <laughs> the first half, the back half's fine. The back half does some, yeah. is, you know, setting stuff up. It's, it's interesting enough. But I really like that first half with Adam Stranger. That was a really cool concept. The idea mm -hmm. that he ends up spreading it to everyone else in Ran and Thanagar because he, he's beamed to Earth. He gets bit and then beams back. Uh, I just think it's really funny. So... Uh, good stuff. Yeah, ten for me as well. Uh, so final book of the week: Jurassic League issue six. Juan Gideon and Daniel Warren Johnson. Uh, I this was a casualty. I read so many books. I've read everything I think in this show up until this point. This is the one that I didn't get to. Matt, take it away. <laughs> yeah. So this is basically the Jurassic League's last stand, and that um, Super Sore in the and the Justice League of Dinosaurs are facing down Dark Hylicide while Bat Sword tries to protect the humans. And, you know, they give Dark Hylicide their best shot. And um, basically, because uh, I'll tell this in two parts, I'll tell this part and then I'll get to the Bat Sword because sure. the Bat Sword part really is where the book exceeds. Um, but they, they, you know, I'll give him his best shot and Super Sword essentially has to sacrifice himself by plummeting Dark Hylicide into, like, a volcano. Um, uh, like, he, he flies him up into uh, space and then slams him back down uh, and creates this gigantic volcano crater. And it's kind of hinting at this is the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, yeah. And that, you know, Batsaur at the end is like, well, whatever you did, you know, I have hope. That you know all of this, uh, uh, you know that your your sacrifice was worth something. And the very last page in this crater, Batsor's hand or Batsor Supersaur's hand comes up through um, with the the end question. But really, the the what made this one worth reading was Batsor coming to the aid of the humans. Who not that he had a disdain for him, but he you know very much talked down to them. Um, but as he's protecting them from all of Dark Hylicide's, you know, dinosaur creatures and Chokerzard, Chokerzard remembers Batsor from when he was a baby and remembers, he goes, you remind me of one that who's, you know, you cried when I ate your parents. And that sets, sets Batsor off to the point where he ends up taking them all on, which leads the humans to stick up for themselves and aid him in his fight. And Batsor saves Robin. Um, and then that's where Dark Hylicide comes up, eats Joker's art to get more power. And that's what leads to Batsor coming to the aid of the Jurassic League. And uh, all the art in it is very well handled and fun. Um, like, again, it keeps to that kind of... Like, it's a Saturday morning cartoon with a little bit of an edge. You know, with these kind of scary dinosaurs throughout. But... Um, Batsor really feels like a proper Batman by the end of this, you know, with the way that he's 
standing up for humanity and for for those that can't stand for themselves. Uh, that's a, almost a, like a lesson he learned from Super Sore and, and Robin. Um, but yeah, it's like it's fine. This would read most like probably the best in in trade form. You know, just sit down one afternoon and zip through them. Like I'm definitely gonna recommend it to Tim if he hasn't read it. Oh sure, feel like this would be up his alley. But yeah, like it's not that it's unfulfilling. You know, it just like it kind of keeps the baseline of what the series was. It's kind of silly. It's, it's very tropey. It's funny because all around uh, it's a good read. It's all around a good read. It's the one that I didn't prioritize. Like, mm-hmm. or I prioritize it the least out of everything that I had to read this week, because yeah. fundamentally I feel like it doesn't almost matter to me how the story ends. I feel like I've already yeah. gotten what I need to out of it, <laughs> and it's just, you know, just at the ending because it has to have an ending, rather than right. because I need to know how it ends, right. kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, okay. So that's it, so yeah. I'll, I'll give it a 7.5. Alright, solid enough. Yep. All right, well, that'll take us out of the part of the show every week where we take our favourites of the week, we pick our favourite moment slash panel, our favourite cover, favourite art, and of course, top five books. So, Matt, what is your moment slash panel of the week? And we read, what, 12 books? Too, too many. Yeah, too many. <laughs> do I go Flashpoint Beyond or do I go Nightwing? That's the real question here. Or do mm. I go Flash with him with the single leg crab? Going. That was, that was that, fun. That's a very on point thing for you, I'd say. It would be, but um, I'll go from Nightwing. Um, there's a really cool page. I don't think we talked about it, but there's a really cool page where he's standing over Blockbuster's corpse, yeah. and it's almost looking up at him through the hole in his chest. Mm. And that's where we get the title sequence of, uh, you know, of uh, vacuum power vacuum. That's fine. Yeah, it's, all, it's almost like there's a sight set on Dick still. So, um, yeah, that'll be my moment. Uh, I think I gotta go with John here in the heartbeat and just oh, that, that flight up. That's good. I think I just have to go with that from Son of kal It's yeah. like, I think it's, just, it's the one that sticks out to me the most this week uh, out of anything. So. Super solid. Yeah. Uh, cover of the week. Uh, I like the main cover for GCPD, The Blue Wall. I think that mm-hmm. looks quite cool uh, with the, the the characters on it. Um, I'll give a shout out to one of the variants, the Jim Lee variant for One Bad Day, which is Penguin rolling up his sleeves. Uh, I think that looks really neat and it's a good moody cover. Uh, my winner, though, has to be just the regular cover for Nightwing. It's uh, Nightwing and Batgirl uh, on a white background. They're basically just in silhouette mm-hmm. with their yellow and blue showing, but inside the black of the silhouette, you have the lights of the city. Uh, it just looks really cool mm-hmm. and really stylized, and I love it. So, Nightwing is my cover. What's your Matt? So I'm. Um, I didn't even think to go look while you were talking on a book I didn't read mm-hmm. to go look at, at the variants. That's why so I did. Looking... I looked when you were yeah. talking about Jurassic League. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that Jim Lee one for One Bad Day is pretty good um no that's not what i wanted um yeah i'll probably just go it's like a cop out but it is a fantastic cover it is that nightwing cover like we yeah. talked about it two weeks ago so yeah yeah no gorgeous uh all right uh art of the week map oh it's it's gonna be dan mora the world's finest it's mm. it, it's pretty tops nightwing might have but the split in the art kind of you know, drug it a little, um, but yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to go with Stefano Raphael for uh, GCPD. Um, otherwise, it probably would have been Dan Mora. But yeah, that's what I'm going for, so. Okay. Very good, for all the reasons I t- discussed in the review of the book itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, top five for the week. And since we actually have uh, like 12 to pick from, this is actually quite Shoot. a hefty amount to, yeah. to whittle down. Um, I mean, I could make it easier and disqualify the books from the previous week, but I feel like there's no point. It's just everything we read, it's all eligible. Okay. okay. Go for it. So then I'll, I'll go, um, trying to remember all of these. Good Lord. I know. I know. <laughs> what did I give the nine to? <laughs> so I'll go Flashpoint Beyond. I'll go Superman Son of kal at two. I'll okay. go Nightwing at three. I'll do World's Finest at five. And was it the night? I'll do the night at, at five. Good lord, this is a tough episode. 
Yeah, this is a tough one to do this on. Uh, so I think GCPD is my number one, I would say. Um, I would say my number two is... Son of Kal-El? Maybe? Number three is Flashpoint Beyond? Number four, Nightwing? Number five, One Bad Day? Maybe? I feel like I'm missing a bunch of stuff. I don't even put the night or... Yeah, I looked at him and I got all overwhelmed. This is actually really hard. I should have been noting down my ratings just to at least say, yeah. okay, numerically it has to be the, at least out of this That's batch. usually what I do and I can keep it because we have about five or six. <laughs> sometimes seven. And I can keep them in order. Not not today. Yeah, it was too bad. Eh? Okay, the top five have been all in void this time because it's hard to keep yep. track of all these. Uh, but uh, there you go. Some, something like that, I guess. Um... But cool. There you go. That's uh, that's that. I will now tell you what's cool. coming next week from DC Comics. So I'll remind you at this point that we will talk about Rogues issue four and Aquaman Andromeda issue three on next week's show. We've just pushed them a week to next week because there was just so many this week with last week's books included. Uh, so next week coming out from DC, we have Detective Comics 1065, Action Comics 1048, DC vs. Vampires issue 10, Batman Beyond The White Knight issue 6, Harley Quinn, issue 23. The Human Target, issue 8. That should be good. Uh, we got Riddler, year 1, issue 1. The Paul Dano book. Should be a cu- an interesting curiosity, at least. Uh, we got Catwoman, Lonely City, issue 4. That's finally wrapping up. It's been so long since issue 3. Uh, Deathstroke, Inc., issue 14. Tim Drake, Robin, issue 2. Batman Fortress, issue 6. DC Horror Presents, Sergeant Rock vs. The Army of the Dead, issue 2. Batman Gotham Knights, Gilded City, issue 1. Punchline, the Gotham game, issue 1. Which I think already came out digitally, because that was already in the uh, the charts for Comixology. So I think that was a digital mm. first book. Uh, Young Justice Targets, issue 4. DC Mech, issue 4. And then Batman, the Audio Adventures, issue 2. Uh, obviously Human Targets, the highlight, I think. Uh, yeah. Next week. Uh, it looks got- like we're getting Rocket Red here. Mm-hmm. So it's another JLI member that we get to see. So yep, and then you got Tech in uh, Action, uh, and you got Lonely City. So uh, I'll have three Black Label books to talk about next week. So that's fun. Yeah, but uh, yeah. cool. Uh, actually, four because Human Target's also Black Label. But I don't think of that as like Black Label in the same way that I'm thinking of the other ones. But you know what right. I mean. Anyway, that's uh, what's coming next week. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Hopefully, you're not too mad that we kind of skipped a week, but. Uh, we are back. More than made up for it this week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I had a nice vacation, in case anyone was wondering. So <laughs> uh, that's why we took a week off. But uh, thank you very much. I will take this time to thank our Patreon producers. So thank you to Tyler Hesson, the Palacios, David Sharp, Board Now, Christopher Moy, David Brown, Al Treisman, and Alison M. Fordyce. Uh, you can, of course, support us over at patreon.com slash TV and uh, help support the content and the podcast. At the $5 tier, you get early access to the show. Whenever it's ready late on a Saturday, versus waiting to the Sunday, if that's of interest. Uh, depending on your time zone, it may be more of a... It'll be there early Sunday morning as opposed to mm-hmm. uh, late Sunday. But uh, if that's of interest, uh, go and have a look and see if you're interested. But uh, you go do that. You can also support us for free by simply liking, subscribing, dinging the bell for notifications on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. All of it helps. Get us on Twitter at DC Comics Podcast and share us with your DC comic loving friends but that is us that is the show thank you very much once again for watching or listening we always appreciate it keep reading DC comics and remember to never get lost in the speed force